You are listening to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. This episode is a two-hour journey into four songs. Who Will Help Me Bake This Bread, A People's History of the World, Fixed Frequencies, and Tartuffe. The guest on this episode is Josh Kemble. Josh is a busy and productive guy. He is the executive chef of Harvest Kitchen. He is the host of a great podcast called The Family Cast, where he pairs music, food, and beverages with great guests like past guests of this podcast, John Paul Peters from Private Ear Recording in Winnipeg, and actor Ryan O'Nan. Josh also sings for the band's St. Didicus. And Dogwood. Josh and I have been meaning to hang out for a long time on this podcast. He and his pal Eric Epps recently made a cover of Nation States for the episode... 77, but it's a thrill to have him join me for this four-song episode discussion. You'll see a consistent theme come out throughout the episode, which I think you'll really enjoy. Josh is on Instagram at Josh Kem, at the Family Cast, at Harvest underscore Kitchen, and at Saint Didicus. Thanks to Josh Kemble. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Josh Kemble, welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Thank you. We're stoked to be here. Very stoked to have you. It's been a long time coming, Josh. You've been yeah. among the most patient people imaginable with, <laughs> with my multiple reschedules with you. So I just want to state for the record for all listeners out there that you have been extraordinarily gracious and patient with me. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm curious if you can sort of like you know, introduce your, your story here to the audience. Cause, um, you know, you, you came on my radar quite a number of years ago, um, through your, your music, but I'm wondering if you can just sort of like trace the listeners, uh, through your, your kind of musical story and however you see fit, like an annotated sure. version. Okay. I'll try to, I'll try to truncate it a little bit because, um, it was such a long time ago and, it's still going and it's long. So I think growing up, uh, kind of a, kind of a musical loving family, not, not everyone played instruments and stuff, but we, there was a, always a strong, um, record collection and a concert going collection and stuff like that. So in my, and most members of my family, including my mother and, um, excuse me, she was a, she was a rocker, rock and roller. She wasn't in a band, nice. like I said, but she went, she took me and, and my aunt took me when she was babysitting, uh, maybe, maybe illegally to concerts backstage <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, as a young age, at a young age. <clears throat> so it was always in the blood, um, records spinning records all over the house. And it, my mom's was more on the rock and roll kind of, you know, heavier rock side during the, um, seventies coming out of hippie revival stuff, moving into like metal stuff, uh, early metal, I would say like, like kiss and that kind of stuff, but, yeah. um, not like, you know, today's standards of death metal or anything, but, um, and then my aunt was low rider, cholo kind of oldies music. And my uncle's was more like pop Prince, and, you know, anything that was on movie soundtracks, wide variety of sounds, wide variety. They all had their own, uh, personalities and agendas with music. And, um, and then my, my, the Mexican side of my family was always uh, music from Mexico and stuff. So, or Elvis and opera stuff like that for some reason. So yeah, always around. And, um, so I'll go through my life go and end high school, finish high school, then join Dogwood. They asked me to join Dogwood sing, be the singer because I was wild and wacky. And I had a lot of, I was writing a lot of poetry Yeah, and, um, no, I had no singing musical experience aside from singing op at open house. I sang an American tale from, um, five goes West, I think, or something like that. I sang one of nice. those songs, <laughs> stupid, <laughs> so bad in sixth grade. And then, um, just joined, I joined the band and I was just trying to write all the stuff I was feeling growing up in a sort of a, um, uh, 
Caucasian mixed family. You know, I was, my mom's family was Mexican. My dad's, my stepdad's family was um, definitely on the, on the white side of things. And uh, they started taking, he started taking our family to uh, like a Calvary chapel, non-denominational kind of um, Christian evangelical church, you know, like uh, seeker friendly, you know, heaven and hell, black and white kind of sure. thinking um, in the church um, arena. And, but, but a Calvary chapel was founded on like ex hippies who had had this revelation on the beach about, you know, about becoming Christians. And so everyone's welcome, uh, until they find out, we find out the truth and then, you know, some are welcome, some are not. Hmm. <laughs> right. Um, but everyone's, everyone's welcome to be saved and, um, you know, then we can work through whatever. But so anyways, there's a lot of music in the church. And so there's a lot of concerts being put on um quote unquote secular and, and and christian at the same time sometimes and i always thought that was cool and then um that got my eyes open to concerts and going to more concerts and so as i was as i was discovering my love of music i got into like um a lot of hip-hop and rap because there was a lot of good rhyming and poetry in that and then that moved more into the heavier stuff when once ice t started doing like body count or yeah um <clears throat> of course run dmc and aerosmith uh run uh you know literally in the video they're literally breaking down walls between the music genres right in the video and um i was like yes let's that's really cool public enemy and anthrax um so all these things i was like dude that's cool and there was this is before anything anyone said like rap rock or yeah or the n-word new metal um, right <laughs> so so i was getting into that um but then i found metal and after through all that um through through because i mean I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I owe it to Ice-T, but like it was, I was watching a lot of UMTV raps and, and uh, yeah, I guess that's one of the, one of the things. So it went from like heavy rock in my mom's record collection to kind of mellow kind of Christians, acoustic kind of stuff. And then it was like boring. Let's find something with high energy for my ADD sure. and um, boom, here's, here comes some metal. And, and to be honest, in California, there was a, a burgeoning kind of churchy kind of metal scene. <clears throat> not a lot of punk rock i would say that i that i knew about but i really got into it with the snowboarding and surfing scene um because the soundtrack is that is my music is propaganda and good renance and bad religion and stuff like that and, I, and then yeah. whoa what are they saying i, I love yeah. these lyrics so it kind of went from like the energy to the the love of it to actually understanding what they're saying and getting a thesaurus and learning what they're saying and why are they how are they they're just saying something totally different about I guess maybe not different, but the church isn't saying these things to me that I have questions about. And they're nice. telling me, they're telling me maybe an antithesis to that. Let me find the in between or let me see who's right. You know, I love it. Well, so you, did you grow up born and raised in San Diego? Have you been there your whole life? I was actually born in Missouri. Um, what? So was I. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm yes. from St. Louis. I was born in Fort Leonard Wood Army Hospital. Wow. Yeah. So kind of middle of nowhere. My dad was my my real dad was in the army and then they we so we moved around from there and then my parents split up. So I never really was in my real dad's life. And then um so I was single with my mom, if you will, for a while until the stepdad came along. And then we then that's when we started going in, into the church families and stuff, you know, into the family of Calvary Chapel stuff. And the, so there was a time when it was just my mom and I and then raised by my the whole Mexican side of my family because I didn't really know his his side. And then yeah, it went from there. But yeah, Missouri. Missouri for all oh, just a little bit. I don't remember yeah. it that much. Yeah. And then when did you get to San Diego? San Diego was, I mean, maybe like three or four years old. Okay. So you've been there like, you, yeah, for, for all intents and purposes, you are from San Diego and now all of your formative years were basically yeah. in San Diego and around that context, right? It's really all I know. Yeah. So, so overall, I would say it's a pretty conservative County. Um, there's, there's like a lot of liberal leanings and I mean, not that there's only two ways to look at it, but it's pretty, it's a military town. Gotcha. You know? So, so, um, you know, Top Gun and Navy bases and all that kind of stuff are here. Um, and so, uh, if you're a hippie or outsider, it's maybe you look at it different. That's why there's such a good underground scene here. I think like for the burgeoning punk and hardcore scenes in San Diego, there's books about it. It's, it's a, a it was a violent time because a lot of, maybe a lot of military children or <laughs> whatever, Yeah. but it, that was here. And, you know, we're, we're like always the ugly stepchild of OC in LA and stuff like that in, in the music market. Gotcha. But here we are. Well, San Diego came up on this podcast somewhat recently in a way that is connected to your life yes. as well. Uh, Ryan Onan, the actor from Queen of the South uh, and many other things, mm -hmm. 
was on the podcast to talk about his his extreme love of propaganda. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. anybody who listened to that episode knows that Ryan feels this in his bones intensely. Yes. yes. Um, and so it was really cool to have Ryan on the show and to talk and to hear his stories about growing up playing music in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And then he pops up on your podcast, the family cast as <laughs> yeah. well, where you two got to go in sort of like a, a, a deep dive on that. And I'm wondering if you can just like, you know, explain that connection of, of you and him and that like San Diego context a little bit for sure. the listeners. And I like just to remind people like that Ryan Onan episode was like so awesome because it kind of inspired me for what you and I are going to be doing on this episode. So I'm just wondering if you can tell me a little bit of stories about you and Ryan. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Ryan, um, so a couple, he's a couple years younger than, than I am. So we, we had Dogwood has, had been playing. Um, that's the band I was in Dogwood. We'd been playing for a while in San Diego County, playing a bunch of shows. And then, so, and then Ryan's, um, I don't know how I put it. He, he has neighbor. One of his neighbors was one of my best friends who was in a band that helped us get shows and play around. So, um, he would always, Ryan would always go to the shows with, you know, with this crew, the North, North San Diego County crew. So there's a bunch of people from within a bunch of, uh, maybe four or five year age range. And then out of that crew, everyone started bands different, maybe some different sounding bands, but Ryan's band in particular <clears throat> was fit. We fit really well together. His, it was, his band was called against the wall mm-hmm. and they had a good riddance propaganda kind of vibe, yeah. which I loved because I was going for that same vibe with myself. Like I wanted, I couldn't, I wasn't as smart or as uh you know, dictationally adept as Greg Graffin, but I could, I was goofy enough to be maybe at the time sounding like a, a snotty propaganda and maybe, you know, I could get the surf sound of black flag and good riddance in it all mashed into one. So I was finding myself in music and I think Ryan found himself through sometimes through our music and then hit and then through his band as they gained popularity, we would play more shows together. And, um, he, he, if you, I don't know if you heard our episode, but he said he was like, he had some really great conversations, uh, w- with some church to people, if you will, like people who are open-minded about, uh, people who have different beliefs. Mm-hmm. And one thing that drives somebody crazy with the coming from the church scene or who has questions is when you don't get answers or you get the cold shoulder, like you're not allowed to ask that question or you're not allowed to talk like that, or wow, you're not saying the right thing about Christianity. So with my music, I was always kind of pushing those buttons and ruffling feathers and, um, honestly getting in trouble with for being the way that I was in the church. Um, not rebellious per se, but more like I would just like some questions answered. And there's some questions that can't be answered, obviously, because as you know, from your other podcasts, like we don't have the answers to like why humans have these religions or whatever. We're searching for something, Yeah, but there's things that can be good about it. And, um, some people have an experience like, like, like Ryan's, unfortunately it sounds like, or, or even, um, to be honest, many people in coming from kids from the church scene don't get the right answers or don't get the right uh, maybe upbringing within that realm that um it causes it causes people to go away and i could see why um even for myself it was like wow this sucks i don't want to be here at all like this yeah. is why am i doing this this is hard i don't like this um i'm just going to go over here and you know follow propaganda around the world or whatever the case may be you know nice because well, they're saying something good too totally yeah, you know, so I, I think this has got kind of like an interesting segue, right? Mm-hmm. So let's explain a little bit what we're going to do here on this episode. So yeah. Ryan kind of reframed the way that I think about some of the podcasts a little bit because, you know, um, Keith and I have mixed up the structure and the format of the show a little bit in recent months for, you know, personal life reasons. Mm-hmm. And Ryan sent me a list of songs that he wanted to talk about. And I was like, what if we just talk about all four? So. <laughs> I am really, I really enjoyed that episode. And then, so I wanted to do the same thing with you. So the okay. songs that you picked were who will help me bake this bread, people's history of the world, fixed frequencies and Tartuffe. Mm-hmm. And I think that based on what you were just saying about, you know, asking questions and not getting specific answers, I feel like this is a really good segue yeah into our our first song um so you want to go ahead should we start talking about some music here yeah that's that's great i think that and especially if we go in in chronological order it we're gonna really tell tell the story of kind of how and why uh, i love them to still and and to for the record i say propaganda and propaganda both whatever yeah. mood i'm in <laughs> awesome. they both sound, i love it they both have really cool sounding meetings to me they do they do one is like i, I love the play on propaganda 
Yeah. And then I also love the emphasizing on the Gandhi. So mm-hmm. like, I, I totally get it. And yeah. I kind of switch back and forth as well. Um, <laughs> so let's go chronologically through sure. these songs that you picked and we'll start with your, how to clean everything selection. Who will help me bake this bread? And there's a few ways that we can go through this. We can talk about the music first, and then we can talk about the lyrics. Does that sound like a good a good approach for you? So we can talk a little bit about the jamming, and then we can talk a little bit about the, the lessons. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the music first. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your standout thoughts on the musical composition and performance of this song and you can take this however you want you can break Mm -hmm. down specific instruments Mm -hmm. certain sections or moments of the song anything that you think is interesting to you about who will help me bake this bread okay so going into my like i said from i learned about them from the fat comps but then hearing that fat mike's favorite it was his favorite release on the label how to clean everything Mm -hmm. i was like oh shit i gotta check this out you know because um at the time i didn't have a record player and we were going on tour a lot i was just getting cds and cassettes and stuff like that so i had to find a way to get it you know and then i got it in the mail from their their fat catalog and yeah or local record store or whatever so i I used to and for some reason i wasn't very good at collecting back then i would just buy something maybe lose it on the road so i had multiple times i've supported you know (laughs) uh the labels by buying multiple copies of of yeah yeah i've been there um but um so hearing the music's like just the even even some other songs in the album, it's like, what are they, how are they playing these songs? Like they're playing like off time intros, like, you know, um, like it, we'll take, I'll just stay on this song. For example, so my ADD is not kicking in too hard yet. Um, who will help me break this bread? Like just the way he, he like kind of, I could picture like if the guitar was a, a, an animated object, it'd be like dancing and it would kind of back off. Its shoulders would kind of like yeah. does that part before he says any words. Um, and then it's not too, I wouldn't even call it a barely an intro. He just plays a couple of things and then it just starts the whole thing just yeah. starts. Right. Um, and, and if I'm correct on the structure on the record, it's like, there's, um, it, there's not, there's not much between each song. There's like, it's just a song, boom, next song starts rips in, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> I really like the way structurally this song, <sighs> If you look at all their songs, <laughs> they're kind of all, almost a lot of them are kind of built on this template right here from this song. Um, opening Ripper, um, really good, really cool, thoughtful words, sometimes more questions than answers in the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry to get into lyrics already, but like it goes with sometimes the music is to me another person in the in the band. The music I agree. Itself. Like capital M music, like as a music as a whole, as a person, as a spiritual being is yeah. in this, um, you know, so it's starting with, so it's getting your, it's just, the music is grabbing your ear, like by the, you know, by, or scruff of your neck kind of thing. Like, a, like the music is the mother right here. And it's grabbing your scruff saying, check this out, listen to yeah. this, you know, <clears throat> you know, um, like, I don't know, like there's another song on the record. He starts with a very, it's a very mellow beat. And he's saying spoken minds too clearly, you know, like that. It's like very yeah. chill. And then it goes in, but this one's not. And this one really, <clears throat> excuse me. This one really catches me for that reason. This one is not chill mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know, they get to, they get to that in other songs and they do that. And he had a specific point on this song and uh, to do so. And, and going through the music, the, the last part I could, I guess I could say about the music is every single person that played on this this track this the musicianship on this track is just it's just fun and it's and it's angry sounding the way they're playing it sounds like he's like beating up his guitar a little bit like when he when he does that that thing that i keep saying the brown brown he's like like punching all the strings at the same time with his you know somehow with his pick or something like i don't know i can't really describe it because i'm not a guitar player but it sounds to me like the the he's making he's making it speak to me baby yeah Uh well um, so let's, let's get into these lyrics too, because I think this is really the core of what connects to you mm-hmm. about this song. And, you know, you've mentioned, uh, sort of growing up around the church, um, and being a, a curious person in mm-hmm. an environment that might not always 
welcome and <laughs> value that quite as much. Really? Um, yeah. Maybe saying they do in, to like to to get people to change the topic or get people to change the subject, like pretending to be open minded, but then maybe not authentically meaning that. Mm -hmm. So we have these lyrics and something that you said earlier, I speak my mind, I question theirs. Mm -hmm. And that is like sort of like the thesis, the overall meaning behind what you were saying earlier about some of your younger years being surrounded in certain communities. And so I am really curious on your take on the lines, the message, uh, things this song reminds you of in your life. Any stories that spring to mind? I'm just curious about the connection of who will help me bake this bread to to your to your yeah. story. Oh, so many. I could I could talk for the rest of my life about this one song. In I particular. believe it. I, <laughs> I mean, obviously, opening with that line, who you know, you know. I speak my mind and I question theirs. That's that could be like a tattoo across my chest. Yeah. You know, that could be on my tombstone. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, actually, when I, but I heard it and I was like, Oh, I really like this, you know, and then I'm listening to it and a little background on after my kind of after my father, my stepfather left when my parents got divorced um, in high school, um, we were pretty, we were poor, you know, my mom did basically open a daycare out of our house so that we, for some more income, we were on welfare and food stamps. For a little bit and um we were it was in an apartment complex so there was kind of like a family aspect of your, your neighbors kind of being good family members too taking care of each other so um this there was a lot of like potluck kind of dinners you know like people bringing in food and um making food together this song is obviously named after a food product right yeah um, so um <clears throat> excuse me so there was already that kind of food um aspect in my life growing up of being community food building community churches are good at doing that you know the potlucks and the uh, homeless outreach or whatever sometimes and um we we were also recipients of you know maybe some leftover foods or people bringing us meals or something like that so there was always a sense of strong community around how food could help sustain uh, uh, human humans basically or a family a family of humans um yeah. <laughs> but we were also my mom in particular she comes up a lot when i'm talking because um she would literally give away her furniture to somebody who was in need. Wow. My, my, when my girlfriend was first, my, my wife was my girlfriend. She was first in our life. And we, she came back to visit a second time. And she's like, uh, Carmen, where's your couch? And she, my mom's like, oh, they needed it. They needed furniture. Yeah. And my wife is like, well, now you don't have furniture, you know? And then she, yeah. <laughs> my mom's like, oh, well, it'll work out. You know, we'll, yeah. get, we'll get something else. So that was kind of the whole idea and, and how I was it kind of opened my eyes to we even as America, even the poorest American is still richer than most of the world. Um, and that, th that's what's taught me. That's that little thing of people giving us stuff, but then we get, we turn it around and give it back or give it away. And maybe we starve a little bit, but they're, they're sustained also. And we're all mm. kind of working together. And then, so like, I hear this song um, and it's about the little red hen. That is kind of an allegory to the little red hen story, classic golden book, you know, and she's like, Hey, who's going to help me? you know, three, everyone's like, nah, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then the, when the bread's ready, then everyone's like, yeah, I can do it. But the hen's yeah. like, well, the hen kind of gets snarky and is like, nah, I'll just, I'm going to feed my babies, you know, whatever. But I feel like somebody like my mom or maybe Gandhi or Jesus would be like, um, you didn't help me make this bread, but I'll share it with you. Sure. And so I, uh, started get, learning about more like the ism. So going through Christianity, I'd learn about communism socialism and other isms why those are bad but i was like some of those things sound kind of good to me you know right like, oops, i'm not supposed to say that um but why are those things bad let me look more into that w let me look into why those things are so terrible for the like why you say they're so terrible and then the more i learned about it, i'm like well i could see you know secular humanism being a, a thing or whatever but there's aspects of it that i love that i like you know that if we could adopt that maybe we could be a better society but humans are lame and we ruin everything. Mm. <laughs> so back to the song is like when I speak my mind and then just, I don't know, just almost, I could break down every single line and being like, why is this a part of my life? You know, I won't bleed for you. Um, death will be the day I concede to you. Like all these, uh, it's also could be an anthem for someone who is a super devout religious person, you know, um, every single line from start to finish could be a super devout religiosity song, you know? Yeah. Um, just if you look at it that way, but I wasn't, I wasn't looking at it that way, but I could see how it, this could be an anthem for anyone who's like, you know, this is my anthem. This is my fight song, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's like, dude, um, propaganda. When I first heard this, 
I was like, yes, a goofy sounding snotty ass brat band. That so, I mean, I have kind of the same voice as Chris sometimes when I, at that age. And I was like, dude, this is, this is amazing because they got the harmonies. They got the musical talent. He's saying I, at the time, I didn't know what he, exactly who everything was saying until I really delved in, but I was like, I'm all, I'm all in for this. This is perfect for me. Um, I don't know. And then I have no need for you. That's when he says that. And, and he, they bring in those super long backup background vocal need harmonies behind it. Yeah. You. And it doesn't stop. It just keeps yeah. going all the way through the last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes higher and higher. It's kind of a, yeah. a, a future nod to um, Megan, but um, that's so great. Right. Um, but he's like, when I'm, when he's saying like, I have no need for you, that's, that could be like a, almost like a teenager coming out of youth group and saying like, what, it, what what's my purpose now? Because at the time, or even, I don't know if it's still like this, but church, the church youth group system uh, doesn't, didn't really have a good program programming for like after high school, then what? Okay, now they're adults. Uh, so you're 18, you go to a Christian school and you get married or, and there's no room for divorce because that's against the Bible. And then half the people get divorced. Yeah. Because they're not taught things the right way, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's just one, that's just an example or whatever. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. <sighs> I don't know. Um, and then another part was, I, I do remember one time when my dad was still around in the, in the, in the family, he said, um, we were talking about paying bills and he's like, they're trying to get us to, they're trying to squeeze, squeeze blood from a turnip or squeeze blood from the stone. And he, and then propaganda says the same thing later in this song, like, dude, cause they're talking about my dad was talking about, you know, getting more money out of us and stuff like that. And it wasn't going to happen at the time. And then propaganda says, and I was like, wait, what is he? So, so the saying means you're not going to get anything out of me that, you know, is not, I've given you all I can, basically I've done all I can on my own, you know, like, yeah, you can't, you, you, you can't, I really want to talk to Chris about this personally, because um, <laughs> he, he's, uh, he's really saying like, I have nothing left to give basically, you know, and um, I've given you everything. I'm not going to do what you say. Basically it's all, and man, now, now the more they talk about it, it could also be a middle finger to your parents, you know? <laughs> yeah. Cause who will help me bake this bread? I'm out on my, I'm out on my own. I'm living in the world on my own. I'm out on tour as a, as a young musician starving. What I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's a, it could be a thing like that too. Now that I think about it, it's like moving out. I moved out the second I turned 18, you know? Well, in the line, I won't bleed for you kind of uh to me signifies a shift in a person's life like maybe you would have previously bled for them mm -hmm. but then you realize that they extract so much from you in sort of a usury manner mm -hmm. that eventually you're like wait a minute i previously well, i would have done anything for you i would have given yeah. everything to you if you would have just met me halfway and like been like my equal mm -hmm. but you don't see me as that so now i have to sever this relationship does that make sense Totally. Yeah. It's, um, it's, and also bleeding for somebody is like pretty, a pretty good sacrifice, you know, like, I mean, not, not even just like in the sense of a sacrificial lamb or anything like that. It's like, you're, you're literally bleeding open or, or donating blood to the American Red Cross. It's yeah. like, you are giving life, you know, basically you're giving part of your life to whatever, whatever he's talking about, the cause, uh, a parents, a family, a church, whatever. So I'm wondering like, Chris, who hurt you? You know, like, mm. um, did you grow up in the church? Did is this is this something that you're telling me about? You know, I won't bleed for you. I've known you for me because I I try to donate blood as much as possible because I've the blood they they keep asking me for my blood. So I'm like, if I can, I will. Um, and that's a it's a sacrifice. It's time and giving and pricking needles and like all this stuff. It's like and it's and it's no it's really no sweat to do it, but it's like it it's a it is a sacrifice to be to some degree. And I never sacrificed, like I never joined the military and went overseas and did that whole thing, <clears throat> excuse me, but that's also a sacrifice. Like there's a chance that you might not make it back, you know? And so right. I, I understand that part of it. My, a lot of military in my family and in this town and stuff like that. I understand that. Um, and it's a sacrifice. And then what are we sacrificing daily on the daily? Um, well, my mom giving me her last penny to buy stuff for school or giving away her last morsel of food to the neighbors or like, what are we doing on a regular basis? And, and that's kind of how I view church now or Christianity or my own life with that is like, I don't re agree with all the kind of tomfoolery and te televangelist stuff, but, but there was something to be said about how we treat other people. Yeah. Literally my mom literally living out the values of love thy neighbor, you know, whether who, no matter who you are, what you look like, what's going on in your life. Um, you know, and some people, some people ostracize, 
my family for being divorced. I, like that's that's not cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. But the ones that didn't, the ones that did not, and the ones that really surrounded us are the ones that I still stay in touch with and respect. You know what I mean? Nice. Yeah. You know, and this song too, like one of my favorite lines in it is peripherally blind, intellectually numb. Oh yeah. And I love that one because, you know, you, you think about like the blinders from side mm-hmm. to from side to side, um, mm-hmm. keeping somebody from seeing what's outside of their narrow worldview, whether it's like yeah. a couple neighborhoods over from your house where, you know, the quality of life is extremely different due to, you know, mm-hmm. structural inequality or whatever. Um, the history of the way that our neighborhoods have developed lead a couple streets over to be totally different universe almost in right. some ways. Yeah. And so as long as you don't have to see it, you don't have to learn. So you stay intellectually numb by staying within your, your blinders and just looking straight ahead of you mm-hmm. without expanding that worldview and going a couple streets over and seeing mm-hmm. what life is like and something that's a little different from what you've experienced. Cause then it prevents you from having empathy whenever you're later on in life. And, you know, does that all make sense? Am I just rambling? No, you're, you're right on. I think the, I think the church worldview, the church view or whatever you want to call it is it can be very myopic. And I think that, I mean, we see it a lot. We've seen it a lot in the past few like elections or like stuff that people start talking about, like, oh, it's San Diego or Southern California or the border is all like this. Right. But that's somebody who's talking from Ohio or Wyoming or, yep. you know, maybe even another country. It's like because they haven't experienced this life down here or in El Paso or San right. Diego or Brownsville or whatever. It's like the, the towns that are on the, the border or even a Canadian border. I don't know. But like, you're not here to see what, what is going on. You're not even go, go macro or I'm sorry, go, go even more micro and see what's going on in my neighborhood, on my street, in my apartment complex, in my house, in my room, in my closet, you know, like keep going, 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 going. And then you're going to see those things. Like as far as intellectualism, it's like, you know, people, people like, they like to wax philosophical and intellectual about all these things that they may or may not know about, you know, take it for what it is like somebody tweeting 140 characters about you know abortion or the border or whatever it's like are you an expert can we have a real discussion about it or are you just saying like this they're wrong and i'm right and yeah you know. and like i lived in mexico for about 14 months uh when i was 24 mm-hmm. and you know going back and visiting um the place where i was from and having people tell me about like what people in mexico thought yeah, yeah. and i'm just like like there's no there's no way that you can yeah. talk about this in <laughs> an even remotely informed manner and i currently am living in the place that you're talking about mm-hmm. and you've as far as i know never gone there never crossed that border never met people mm-hmm. never understood like their what their lives are like or <laughs> why they might make certain choices like i literally was so stupid josh that i moved to mexico and thought that people in mexico wanted to move to the us like that's how stupid I was. And like I was talking to people and I was like, oh yeah, so do you ever want to like move north or anything? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like this is I lo- this is where I live. Like, why would right. I you know what I mean? Like, so that's how stupid I was about all this and you know, going somewhere right, right. and seeking to, you know, not remain intellectually numb is to me one of the greatest gifts of being a human. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's just that it's just a matter of as, as I've grown you know, I'm a minor at heart always, but like, as I've matured, like, uh, and in my worldviews and the way I feel about, you know, the church and, or the non-church culture or whatever the case may be, it's like, I understand that, man, everybody's the same, actually. Yeah. You know? <laughs> everybody's actually the same. We're all looking for validation. We're all looking to find some answers and we all just want to hug. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't what, know. What year did you find how to clean everything as a record? Um, 1990, that must've been 95, okay. 96. Okay. So yeah. it had been out for a while. Was less talk more rock out by the time you found this or was this pre yes. less talk? I found, I, I think I got less talk first. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, I, I'm ju- I was just curious like where all this fit in. When did you first see propaganda live for the first time? That must've been 97. I saw them on tour with good riddance. Okay. Um, okay. And, so, before, and then I fell in love with good riddance from there. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Um, so do you have any other, like, you know, before we move on from how to clean everything era, 
I'm wondering if you have any other overall sentiment about that LP that you'd like to share or any other takeaways or impacts from, you know, this song or others, you know, just that, that really stand out that you felt like sharing. Oh, from how to clean everything. Yeah. I mean, man, I, I often go back to this record and listen to it front to back. And, um, it's, it's, it's really cool to just hear it's here. It's cool to hear a band's first full length for one thing. And if you're still, if you stay a fan the whole time or whatever and go through and, you know, go from start to finish, how they've changed, how they haven't changed or whatever. It's like, um, <laughs> it's almost like I can hear, I can grow up with, I grew up with them kind of, I grew up in my own career with propaganda or with Chris's lyrics or the music or whatever, the changes they did. Um, but, but hearing this record and hearing the, trying to understand the things they were, they were saying, you know, cause Chris uses some $5 words, just, just like Greg Graffin. And, um, uh, I feel like it made me smarter in some ways, you know, it wasn't just, um, it was like a lesson in, in not just punk rock, but like, he's all, you know, he's talking about uh, feminism and politics and, and, and even different religions and different cultures and different countries. And he sounds very well-traveled and, you know, at least from the lyrics, from what I understood way back then is like, he's, this guy sounds smart or he's there. They're writing about cool things. And and then it inspired me to write about those things from my, my viewpoint, my standpoint, it's like, this stuff's happening in the church. No one's doing anything about it. How can we talk about it? And I got in a lot of, I did get in a lot of trouble, but I, and I, uh, I'm okay with that. Nice. <laughs> Well, should we move on to Let's Talk More Rock? Let's do it. Okay, so you chose the song People's History of the World. from less talk more rock and you said you got less talk more rock first right i believe that was the order yes okay cool (laughs) um so what's interesting i got how to clean everything first but i didn't get it until like nine late 97 early 98 so i got them in order but i got the first one first because it's just the way that it fell into my lap um so let's talk Mm -hmm. about people's history yeah um tell me I personally think that the way this song starts with like that, that quiet guitar and then it kicks in that this could have been the opening track on the record. I feel Uh, like it might've been, I feel knowing, knowing what I know about, about uh, Ryan, you know, it, it, it probably was, I don't know. It it would have been a rad opening track for sure. I I think it would because it's talked about such a big picture. Like the Mm -hmm. message of this song is so big picture and can, Mm -hmm talk about just about it talks about all of human history in the right. first line yes you know what i mean this to me uh almost is sort of a missed opportunity as an opening track um <laughs> which yeah. maybe that'll maybe that'll make somebody mad but i, I think this would have been the, a really good opening track just because of that opening effect on the guitar and then how it kicks in and then it talks yeah. about every person in the world all of human history um so kind of a lot to what, tackle. <laughs> it is. So tell me what you think about the the music and the performance on this particular song. Yeah. Like that. So good. And that and that you hear that again throughout the song. Um I could believe I I could uh picture Ryan, the producer, being like, um, let's put this, let's let's turn this down, and then we're gonna kick it in, you know? Yeah, the turning point in his t- so like <sighs> When the way the music, like again, again, the music, capital M music, being this the spiritual mother of the band. Uh, I don't know if this is t- that's too woo woo, but I feel like sometimes the the music is meant to be another uh, a a, pers- a personality, and um, that little like thing, that little like and the way it's quiet is like okay, gather around, we're gonna tell yeah. you a story. Yeah, it's we're like a tell kindergarten you teacher in a sense. Yeah, and as far as an opening track, uh, um or sequencing to where it is um it, it really does set the tone for i mean the the cover of the album is like you know just it it uh is the what, calgary rodeo or something like that yeah it yeah stampede doesn't really have to do it there could have been many cut different covers for this record but like they sure they go with the stampede um <laughs> sure um <laughs> i think it was the 84 stampede poster i think it was yeah like sure it, maybe yeah. it's significant to to something on the record but um but uh, but uh as far as the turning point in history I mean, it's also, 
it's a turning point in history for the for the band because like the record the record like sound the sound is different it, it's mm-hmm. not it's still snotty it's still like cool like snotty i don't even like saying skate punk about this band but um but they have um they did a lot of different musical things on this album that they hadn't done on at least on not on less talk I mean, um, on uh, how to clean everything, excuse me, but uh, but uh, starting with that little like, come on, gather around, ri- little like, axe riff thing, and then going into the into the song, and then he starts doing these like, um, almost these like arpeggio kind of little notes when he sing while he's singing. Um, I don't remember if they have two guitar players at this point. No, nope. you tell me. Okay, no. So no. he's so. How is he doing that? How is he doing? It? And I didn't. You know, I was I was just learning about tracking in the studio at the time. But then they they still played it live like that. You know, when he's when he's the part I'm talking about is when he's just kind of picking notes like like <laughs> I'm not gonna sing it. I'm not gonna do that thing. But there, <laughs> there, if you know the parts I'm talking about, he's because he's playing the, all this ripping metal riff while he's singing, which is already hard work. He's do, he's like you know being. James Hetfield over here and um, playing these metal riffs while he's singing. And then he starts doing these arpeggios, like these pinky arpeggios across the the higher part of the guitar neck um, to add to the musicality of this punk song. Yeah. So it sounds like they have three guitar players. I think you're talking about the parts where like manufactured our delusion. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. Like, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. It is. It is. Um, And then it, and then it goes, and then it breaks it down too. This guy, it's got a really cool, stopping point a breathing point to the bridge you know you can vote however the you know like he's yeah, like yeah. going into that whole slow part um and then he starts he starts talking about you know, old things that actually uh, american political uh, figures have said um in those lyrics too so i think that the music is really i don't like if you <laughs> if you look on their website he doesn't break down line by line it's just like all the words no yeah. spaces you know, maybe even like less punctuation. It's just like words, stories. So like he's it's like writing. A, it's like a paragraph. Yes, yes. He's telling us a story. He's telling us an anecdote or something, and it's just there. And then he's somehow making it work with this beautiful music. It sounds beautiful. Like if you really listen to the musicality of it, it's beautiful. Yeah, I like. So Keith and I, we we did an episode about this song ages ago, um, and we went through this in excruciating detail. But <laughs> recently on one of our episodes uh i think it was on the note to self episode we talked about how much of a probability there is that something will become legislation based on public support Mm -hmm. and we found some studies that showed that there can be hardly any public support of an issue or roughly a hundred percent public support of an issue and based on the structure and the way that like the government of the United States is set up, mm-hmm. there's roughly a 30% chance something will become passed into law. Mm-hmm. Even if a hundred percent of the population supported it, it would still only have about a, a 30% chance of becoming law. And so to me, this is a really interesting line and you, you know, religion keeps coming up in this episode and it talks about the monopolized power mm-hmm, mm-hmm. confined to a few. So in this line, in this line, it talks about how priests, clerics, and elites have the monopolized power within society and how the rest of us are merely there to serve those at the very, very top. And which is a very dark message, but there's a lot of truth that that springs from it when you consider how difficult it is to be elected to public office in the United States today. Um, and how much power is, you know, just concentrated far outside of your reach, far outside of my reach. Yep. And you know how you almost have to be born into it to be destined to have that monopolized power. And I'm wondering if you can just reflect on that a little bit coming from the world that you come from and some of the history that you have in your life and what this lines yeah. of the concentrated and monopolized power mean to you. Sure. I mean, the basic generalization of, a, of, a, of the church context is that the pastor is in charge. Um, and where's the pastor getting their power from is like either the board or God himself, or, mm-hmm. you know, or the, sometimes the pastor is worshiped as a, as a deity in some cases, you know, and then not every church structure is like that, but that's the generalization is like, that's the pastor's church. You know, he's, it's it, he or she, well, back then it was all he, um, 
no, you know, no, you don't question that. That's like authority, you know? And wow, you tell me to, not to question authority and me, I'm going to, you know? Uh, it goes and it goes and that goes back to my love of bad religion and like uh, just figuring out answers for myself is like you're telling me what to do. I'd like to figure that out for myself, please. You know, and then so uh, monopolizing power, I, 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 and this this gets into the other songs that I chose also. Is, but I saw that happening in my own home. Um, this guy comes into our life and we decide to go go from you know Mexican Catholic church to this predominantly. Um, non non-catholic very non-catholic uh, calvary chapel system church <clears throat> excuse me um which is very like you know you mess up and you're going to hell god wants god wants to forgive you it's like oh okay well there's a there's a there's still hope for me i'm still i'm a, i could still be a good person you know because but you know on on that on that note like the catholic church that we grew up in is like there's still there's a lot of guilt stuff in that too um but I'm not as involved with that anymore in the Catholic side of things, but um, in the Calvary non-denominational, the monopolization of power is, it is, is definitely a structure. It's definitely a structure. There is like the head guy all the way at the top and then the uh, sub pastors or whatever. And then there's like celebrities and there's like, you know, um, it was really strange in a sense. Cause it's like the father of the church and whatever, you know, like we didn't, right. we didn't say, we didn't call him father or anything like that, but it's like, uh oh, what's what's happening now? It's like, you know, these are your basically every other family is your kid, even if the families are older than you or whatever. It's like it's such a weird dynamic um, because, yeah. yeah, this person's like in charge, quote unquote, of everyone's spirituality or, or their their walk or whatever. It's like, how can that? How that's weird. <laughs> that's yeah. weird, and that's a lot of pressure to put on someone. Also, it's a lot of pressure to put on one person to be in, in charge of everyone's fate. You know? Yeah. Which is how now I've realized that America feels like it's their responsibility to save the world, you know, mm -hmm. like the white the white savior to other impoverished nations, or like the financial savior when we're when we're borrowing money from other countries, or like you know, like I don't know. It's just so weird because it don't, it kind of trickles down from basically the way our nation was founded on Christian values, and we're a Christian nation, or you know, Puritanism, or anything like that. It's like <clears throat> at what cost? at what cost and that goes into uh, the uh, you know fixed frequencies yeah you know let's um let's jump do you want to jump over to fixed frequencies if you'd like yeah that because uh yeah i mean and uh, just one more thing on the lyrics is absolutely was, uh, yeah yeah one more thing on the lyrics for uh, people's history of the world is um it got me it also got me reading howard zinn you know um and then yep. or me just too. Yeah, it got me reading. It got me reading, really. <laughs> yeah. In general, it got me interested. It got me interested in like, you know what? Harcourt Brace Ivanovich is not the only history book out there. You know, the, the, the and that's a Dutch company making our American history books, you know, mm -hmm. a Northern European company making our children's history books. There's so much other history that is not in these history books. And I learned that after I was done with school already, unfortunately. Um, what are they not telling us? And why are they not telling us this in school? Why did they not tell us about Juneteenth or all these different things that happened to indigenous people or first nations on our continent? And then why am I getting in trouble on, if I say, if I say something about Canada day or 4th of July, if I just say something like, Hey, read your, you know, don't read your history books, ask somebody, you know, I'm saying, I'm still trying to ask these questions in the ruffle of feathers because we don't, we, there's a reason why it's called the people's history. Right. And not like, just history books or whatever the case may be. It's like, they're not telling us something in, in these classes. And that's why college courses offer so many different things like Latina women's experiences or like people of colors experiences. Like there's very specific studies you can do because it's all the stuff they didn't teach you in <laughs> school. Yeah. Well, and this song talks about, and if your schools won't teach our, teach us, we'll yeah. teach ourselves. And so the name of the song is very much saying like people's history mm -hmm. needs to be differentiated from history. So you go to school, yes. you enroll in a class, you go to yes. a history class and you mm -hmm. are learn a certain thing. <laughs> Keith and I have talked about this so much on the show, right, considering right. we're both teachers, but <laughs> how true. history and people's history are two very, very different things as well. Right. It could be, it could also be in this case, history to me is synonymous with experience you know, people's experience of the world. Um, yeah. Cause the history of, of, uh, cause like even the, even the book, like the Bible, it's like, that's really just the history and story of, you know, the, the Jewish people or God's people, if you will, or whatever. And then, you know, come to find out it's 
kind of penned by William Shakespeare at some point, or, you know what I mean? It's like, it becomes a history book or a history lesson, a guidebook of, for history. It's like, they don't talking about, they don't talk about abortion in the Bible. They don't talk about like drug use in the Bible necessarily. They, you can, you could pick out an allusion to it, but it's like, they're not saying, you know what I mean? It's just like, a, it's part of the story. It's yeah. not the whole thing. You know what I mean? So, I mean, totally. that's my viewpoint and I, and I've gotten in a lot of trouble and still do for my viewpoint on that. You know, something that, that strikes me about this song, and I'm just kind of realizing this right now is that Keith and I have noticed that a lot of the songs tend to end on a note of hope after mm -hmm. a lot of lyrics that are very despair inducing. There will be something like rise at the end of note to self or whatever. After a very dark song, we have this <laughs> note of hope mm -hmm. and that happens in tons of songs. Mm -hmm. And this one doesn't, this one doesn't end on a note of hope. And I think that might be the less talk more rock era. Um, but it says, believe it or not, even if democracy broke loose, power would just make the economy scream until we vote responsibly. So it's like the, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down um, aspect is like this song. It's like, and even if you vote a certain way, and even if we actually had this victory, uh, they would just ruin our economy and send inflation sky high and send interest rates sky high and, you know, make everything unaffordable. And then we back down and because life becomes so difficult that we, <laughs> you know, are just it's trying to, to make it on a, mm -hmm. on a day to day basis uh, that we have no choice but to back down from taking over power. So this one doesn't really tend, it doesn't seem like it ends on that note of hope that we've noticed in so many other songs. And I'm wondering how you feel about the fact that this one kind of ends like on a, well, you can try, but you're still screwed kind of like yeah. ending. Like, like almost like nihilistic. It's like, well, or, or it could be a call to action. You know, nothing's going to change until you vote responsibly. Yeah. Like if here's your, here's the solution, you know, I mean, here's the, here's a, here's a, maybe, maybe something that could help, you know, all this stuff's going to, all this stuff happened. It's the history. And uh, even if, even if democracy broke, even if we could do this stuff, they're still going to, they're still going to bring us down and, you know, until we vote responsibly. Right. So yeah. if you guys are, if you guys don't want to see history repeat itself, you have a chance to change that. Maybe, if you start by voting at the small level or voting at the big level, if the voting system isn't corrupt, um, you know, maybe that's your, that's the solution. Cause otherwise, you know, we're screwed. We, they've been in power for so long, obviously look at the, the, the way we, we built our country or other countries even, or the world manifest destiny, all that stuff is like, you know, voting is supposed to be able to help that. Yeah. Um, I promise you, you promise me, like we're, we're trying to help each other and they're, they're not letting us help each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, Josh, you you mentioned that you enjoy things that uh, that that prod, you know, the the unorthodox within society, which I dig. This <laughs> record, the cover, the mm -hmm. words around the, the yeah. edge of the cover, yeah. I feel like this is probably important, and I should ask you about it. How do you feel about the fact that this record does exactly what you say you enjoy so much about, you know, being alive? Right. So being well raised mostly by my mother i am pro-feminist you know like number one like like when you see i mean i i'll, I'll actually i will i will save this this answer for another the other songs but i think that being pro i'm pro-feminist in the sense that i have a mother i have yeah. a wife i have a daughter like that's just three those are three generalizations and some some hardcore feminists would be like it's more than that i'm mean, like i know but those are the first three things on my mind so in that sense, and if, and then and I would argue against anyone in the church who's saying feminism is like blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, let's look at some stories from Jesus's life, born to, you know, uh, unwed mother, who was the first person at there, who was the last person to take him to the cross, who was the first people that he saw when he came back from the dead. If you believe the story, it's like, those are all women. And the Bible is, the Bible talks a ton about Jesus doing food stuff and Jesus talking to women and just hospitality and all around. Oh yeah. And the, and then the water to wine story, that was all about, you know, his mother said his, he was trying to keep his mother happy. Jesus was pro-feminist. Boom. Yeah, stop full stop. Um, and then the, what's the other ones? Uh, and, uh, pro pro gay positive. Yeah. Gay positive. Gay positive. It's like, um, what, it, so what is, so in the church, uh, let's say, I, this may or may not be a true story. Wink, wink. There's a, there's, I have a friend who's gay in the youth group. Are, are you going to tell him he can't come to church Yeah, because he's gay? He's trying to be a good person. He's struggling with his own sexuality 
And it's hard to do that as a middle schooler or high schooler. I get teary talking about it because it's like, why wouldn't the church <laughs> or, or a punk rock or any community, why wouldn't you let this person be a person just because they don't like, aren't you, wouldn't you be stoked to have them over to your house? They're not going to try to get your daughter pregnant. Like there's all these other things that you could like argue for. And also they're one of my best friends. Are you going to tell me I can't be friends with them? Like, yeah, you know, fuck that. Yeah, like, yeah. I, that's, that's, that's really stupid. I didn't know that many gay like girls growing up because I don't think that was very, it wasn't very like uh common. At least they weren't out. I don't know. Right. They, obviously they were around, but they weren't as out as the, you could see kind of more like when a guy was maybe perhaps at least in my world, at least down here in San Diego. Um, and honestly, it, you know, there was the tropes like revenge of the nerds and like all these different things in the eighties movies of, of what gay was, but like, it's not always just like, again, it's not that black and white. You could be like having tendencies or bisexuality or all the other, you know, anything that you, you could be feeling growing up as a kid, when you're questioning yourself, or you, if you come from a broken home, you don't have as many like positive figures in your life. It's like, well, I'm going to find my own way, Yeah, you know? And, uh, when I, if I have a, if you spend a lot of time with uh, this group of people, you might turn this way. If you spend a lot of time with this group of people, you know, you might go the uh, totally opposite direction or whatever the case may be. So it's like, why as a church would we not be positive to all these things? We, if they're supposed to say everyone's welcome, why isn't everyone welcome? So yeah. gay positive. Sure. Yeah. I'm not, what's wrong with that? Who cares? Right. Um, and what's the third one? Uh, so it's anti-fascist and animal fascist. friendly. Yes. Animal friendly, anti-fascist, animal friendly, anti-fascist. That should be a no brainer. If you're a real American <laughs> yeah, or a real Canadian, um, yeah. that should be no brainer. Cause, but then now it's become such a thing where anyone who doesn't agree with you is a fascist. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think anyone even knows what the history of fascism is when they're arguing about it. You we, might because of your other podcasts and stuff, but we definitely you know. collectively as a country need to uh, stop, you know, throwing around a lot of terms that we don't understand. Like that's one of our right. Definitely one of our intellectual weaknesses I've noticed is that when mm -hmm. people talks about any concept, any deep philosophical, mm -hmm. political, social con um, concept. Yeah. And they are just bandying about what they've heard on television. It's reckless and honestly boring. It, it, so, you know, that's how I kind of feel about that. It's become so, it's become trite to just use words like calling someone a, a socialist or a fascist or a, a, a and a bit like how can or even just to put it in political and presidential terms, how can the, how can you call this president a fascist and they say, no, this person is a fascist. It's like, no, there can really only I don't think you understand this. And it's not an ism. It's not like a, a full belief system. It's you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. And, and I don't know. That's a uh, that's a whole like disgusting long topic that I could talk about forever because I hate it so much. But like as also as a as a church, if you want to keep going from that church viewpoint, it's like, it, it, yeah, the church should be anti-fascist too. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a basic one for me. It's like anti-fascism. Yeah. Americans are anti-fascist. Well, so Josh, there's a, you know, the, the theme that we keep returning to is a lot of tied to your own personal history and, you know, growing up within mm. the church community and, you know, learning how to question those kinds of things. And I think that that jumps really nicely to our next song mm -hmm. from, we're going to jump from 1996 to 2005. To Potemkin City Limits, and we're going to talk about fixed frequencies. Now, I have to caveat this <laughs> because this is a song along with Fadal's Hearse from this record that feels like something that is entirely forgotten by this podcast to date. Hmm. We've never talked about fixed frequencies um, on this podcast. People have been asking for it since day one, and we just flat out. <laughs> haven't done it ah. um this song fadala's hearse uh this song uh fixed frequencies fadala's hearse and highly selassie are three songs that i just haven't really engaged with on mm -hmm. this show that much um and i'm thrilled you picked this one because it forces me 
to address <laughs> it and yeah. to talk about it. But um, one of the reasons that I've never really talked about this one or Haile Selassie to date is because I've talked about religion so much on my other podcast, Classical Ideas, that I've been doing for like five years. And I've you know done episodes on uh, Israel. I've done episodes on Palestine. I've interviewed Palestinians who live in diaspora on that podcast. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed people who are proclaimed Zionists on that podcast. And anytime that you address a topic like Israel and Palestine and the, you know, the biblical um, Judea and Samaria and stuff like that, if you miss any detail, I feel like you're you're setting yourself up for yeah. a a what about ism mm -hmm. endless stream of comments mm -hmm. to where it feels like there's no way that you can comprehensively do a song like this fixed frequencies mm, yeah. or highly selassie without endlessly hearing about what you missed. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is the reason why I have shied away from doing those particular songs. And this is why I was so happy that you picked it because you kind of forced my hand to acknowledge <laughs> that fixed frequencies exist and yeah. that it totally rules. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about the music first. Yeah. So tell me your thoughts on the musical composition and the performance of this song, because it's, it's very, very special, very mm -hmm. unique. There's so much vocal layering that goes on and A I'm lot. just, I'm yeah. just wondering your your thoughts in general musical uh, assessment of this tune. Music first, music first is like the song is an absolute banger. Even though yeah. it's not, it's not like a, it's not a fast like fist in the air kind of kill you circle pit song. It's a surprising or song to follow. Or is it? Yeah. yeah. It's a surprising um, one to follow speculative fiction, like because it slows down that speculative fiction, like that fast, predictable mm -hmm. pace that you're come to know and expect from like a record opener. Yeah. But then this one just like hits the brakes a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a surprising second song. You're, you're right. I think. And it's equally to me as powerful in another way with the music, because it's got that drum beat that I love. Um, the da -da 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 -da. It's a very yep. driving foot beat. Um it's a deer um, coach's corner style deer coach's corner i mean um other other bands have taken on have done this beat also that i love i just love it i love the it still has that punk power that you would come to expect from a punk rock song <clears throat> excuse me and um again it's that music the, the mother music speaking um to me this one has all that that the powerful drums throughout of course he's a powerful drummer um but he's also it's a beautiful it's a beautiful um it's beautiful musically on the guitar too um, to me, I could, <clears throat> excuse me, I could have gone for a little bit more bass, bass in the mix on this one, on this song, because it's, it has a groove and, and it really, so the rhythm section of a band could really perform on this song, just the, with the tempo and the beat that they have I'm not complaining about it. It's just, I would have loved to hear more of it. Right. Um, but the, but the, it has the, the musical has got like a couple of breakdowns that he does really well on the guitar where he's just kind of picking some strings, um, while he's still singing and again like he's so talented on on his with his musicianship um of, of course the harmonies being some of the music also the harmonies the way the harmonies react to each other with the vocals are also in harmony with the the musicianship um if that makes sense so there's like the the vocals and the guitar and the bass are all creating this harmony together this melody this like almost like dissonant melody the way he's the way he's doing them and um <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know what's happening in my throat there, but um, this song musically, I love, I love the just that breakdown of what you've come to expect from propaganda. It's like you know, it's not this is not ska punk, this is not snotty skate punk, this is not again double time beats, this is not the Fat Record sound or Epitaph Records or G Seven. Like it's like they almost invented a new sound with this song. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, like they. <sighs> they figure out a way to play the guitar a little bit slower with beautiful chords, you know, these, these like weird minor ninths and stuff like that. And then like also, but a powerful drum beat behind the whole thing. There's not a song like this on today's empires, tomorrow's ashes, really. No, no. You know? I mean, this is, this is, I could, I could also, I could picture this song being in like movie soundtracks or having like a, an R and B singer singing it. 
um, like it's such a well-written, well-constructed song. And if anyone from the band is listening, this is just like such an inspirational musical piece, just the music alone, even like I said, um, the way it's written. And I can tell through this, through the chord structure and song structure that I don't know if I'd be able to play it. And yeah. then of course it also has a breakdown with the, um, with these octave slides um, towards the end, like, like how, how much more groove can you add to one song? Yeah. You know? You know, and it really is sad to me that this record was so overlooked when it came out by fans of the band, because to me, I, this song and Cut Into the Earth from Potemkin City Limits are two of my favorite propaganda musical compositions mm -hmm. that exist in the entire discography. Mm -hmm. Like, I mm -hmm. think that yeah. this record, like especially Cut Into the Earth and this song, Fixed Frequencies, are two of the most unique musical yeah. pieces that they've ever done. Like if they were just available as instrumental tracks, they would still be interesting. No, you're totally right. Uh, if this was fully instrumental, it would still be one of my favorite songs. Yeah. The reason that I picked this song is because this is one of the songs that the music and the music is like um, one of the vocals and the vocals are like part of the music. It's like, this is such, such a cohesive song. Um, this is such a cohesive song. And I haven't even started talking about the, the lyrical content. We're, like, we're, we're going to get there. I promise. No, I mean, I'm saying like, this could be, I can't, I can't talk about how well, how well, well written this song is. And it's inspired me to write songs like this. And it's got the, it's got the all pummel vibe, like the, you know, um, broken, got that kind of tempo where I could picture like Stefan Edgerton playing guitar in this, or I know that Bill, I know that they did this at Blasting Room. Um, no, they didn't. Not this one. Uh, they, or, or they, but the guys mixed it and did it. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Jason Livermore mixed this one. Yeah, it, was okay, an, so, it was an emergency mix. The story on that is on Patreon. Yeah, it's so oh, that's funny. right. That's right. I, I, I just, I, I just automatically built when I see Bill and Jason's name on there, I'm like, Oh, cool. It went to blah, blah. blah. But I, I know that Bill is a, <clears throat> Bill is a, uh, a, a melody man. You know, mm -hmm. he's good at, he's obviously good at drums and, and songwriting, but he's, he's got these like weird melody ideas too. And I could hear, I could picture Stefan also playing. So like I said, it's such a well-written song that I could picture other people doing this song. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. That, that to me, that's a good song. I love it. Well, and I, I love that you specifically honed in on the drums immediately at the start of your point, because to me, Potemkin City Limits has maybe my favorite drum recording. I, mm -hmm. I think that the snare drum sound on Potemkin City Limits is is my favorite. It like whenever I listen to it in my car, extremely so loudly. Yeah, I, I cannot get enough of the drums on this record. So I'm glad that you went there immediately because I <laughs> like whenever I think about drums, I'm like I think that Potemkin's my my favorite drum sound. I don't know. Um, mm. Okay, so let's get into the lyrics here. Yeah. So this one I've got some thoughts on. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this opening line here in the land that Abraham was promised to receive. We listen to you catechize from your pulpit overseas. So we've Boom. got this opening reference to, <laughs> yeah. to Genesis 12, right? Mm -hmm. Where right. The, it says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So we've got this opening reference right to the Bible smack dab in your face. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the biblical reference here in this opening line. Yeah, this, I mean, th this, this has always been a, this has always been a point of contention for myself, for family members, for other people in the church. When I talk about this, um, because it's like in Genesis, in that verse where it's Abraham, he's talking about Abraham. And I'm wondering if Chris is like totally like raised in <laughs> some kind of church system that I was, but like, that God is basically telling Abraham to do manifest destiny. Mm. Wow. God is saying, Hey, here's some land. Take it. You know what I mean? You, yeah. you have some land. Don't worry about that land that you have go to that land and that's yours and your generations to come will all be there. And that's why it's so messed up because everyone's fighting over this thing that they thought that was theirs, you know? Um, and then, so we took that message and spread it across, you know, empires and, you know, English and everywhere that basically people thought they were the chosen ones to take over this new land. And henceforth, here we are, it comes to America in the, you know, 16, 1700s. And it's just kind of still happening today of like open space land is not 
we can't have land anymore. It has to be condominiums or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's a, it goes from Genesis to today. And because God said to Abraham, go get some land. It's cool. So then we have this, this, this catechize mm-hmm. term, which I think is super important. So catechism, teaching mm-hmm. catechism is like talking about the tenets of a religion, right? Yes. So and it's usually to, to youth. Yeah, so it's Typically. like synonymous with with preaching, right? So we've got mm-hmm. it. Uh, we've got this this church reference to the way that the story of Abraham's family rec- having this promise from God is then taught in every church across the world, right? So many of these like pulpits are um, that where the catechism is delivered are from churches that are extraordinarily far away from this specific spot on the world that we're talking about, which leads to people having a very, very narrow view of what the history of that spot actually is, because most people will never actually go there and experience it for themselves. True. Um, Tell me a little bit about, you know, the, the catechism of the Holy land uh, from like an American point of view. Well, yeah. So, I mean, even to go back to the title of the song, fixed frequencies in the singular form in radio communications, fixed frequency is something that's immovable and changeable. Like that's the, a fixed station is like, nothing's going to change. Nothing's wow. You know what I mean? Nothing is, um, you're not going to change anything about this frequency. You can add to it or, uh, uh, on different frequencies or different channels, but this fixed frequency is our, is the go-to, you know, the standard, um, the, the bedrock of this radio communication satellite or whatever the case may be a station. So it's pretty interesting that he chose fixed frequencies because he doesn't say the word necessarily say anything about radio communications in the song, but he's talking about, <clears throat> so the, so the catechisms is, like I said, it's usually at least in the, on the Catholic standpoint, um, the, the, I guess the the Calvary Chapel and the the other denominations they don't always use words like catechisms. They don't use a lot of the words that the Catholic Church would use or the the Pope would use, you know. Right. Um, But catechisms is something that you teach younger uh, people coming up in the church, so they can learn all the the tenets and the rules about how to be in the church and how to Mm -hmm. be that person, right? Um, And then if you're teaching like like in a youth group setting, the story of Abraham would be like a probably an early teaching. Like that's because it's Genesis and you want it. And if Abraham had a son, Isaac and all this stuff, like there's all these stories that are coming from Genesis because it's the foundation of the Bible, the foundation of the Torah and the Christian, you know, all the different beliefs and religions that came from these stories. Um, and then when he says settler, uh, we, we both speak a settler's can't. Yes. It's not can't, C-A-N can't. apostrophe T that's C-A-N-T, no apostrophe, which is right. a, hip- a hypocritical statement. I mean, the cant is like a, a sanctimonious statement that a, a, a Christian person might use um, to, and if there is, if it's a settler's cant, that's that to me, that's like the pilgrims talking to the native Americans yes. or, you know, Israel and Palestine fighting with each other. Like, Hey, God said, this is my land. Well, God told me this is my land. So who's, t- who's right. Who's wrong. God yep. told one God told us say different things. That sounds crazy. Um, <laughs> or, yeah. or. Uh, conquest of the Roman empire based on, you know, Constantine's rule or whatever the case may be. I mean, I could have those two different empires wrong. I'm sorry, but I'm talking about like spreading a message in the name of holiness, yep. killing whoever it takes to, to get there. Yeah. Well, and then we've got this other line too, like you mourn the proofs of our barbarities. Yeah. That, and, and it's like, so we, we, you know, uh, you can, you can be in the United States and you can be a person who believes in, you know, you could be on like the left, the far left and you could be heavily critical of certain countries around the world Mm -hmm. while also sitting here and benefiting tremendously from the conquests of Mm -hmm. your ancestors. Mm -hmm. So I know that it's different to say, okay, this is the world that I've inherited. This is the con the context in which I live, but without acknowledging all of the ways that you benefit from past conquests, uh, critiquing conquests now has a, a, an ahistorical awareness to it. So mm-hmm. you, in order to, you know, you obviously should critique conquests today, but like understanding your place within the history of conquest, I feel like is very important as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's like basically like, I wasn't brought here. I was born or, you know, like, like, like a uh, white guilt kind of like, it's like, I didn't own slaves. So right. 
I know. I just listen to me and you know, blah, yeah. blah. like there's the, it just all comes down to like listening to the other person as settlers or as as colonialists or anything like that, or or even moving westward expansion, or I mean, I hate to say this, but the the San Diego Padres are named after Padres who are, you know, you know, people who came over here yeah, like, to proselytize and basically yeah, like, murdered murdered Native Huna Americans. Pero, like Huna Pero Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We got a high school named after him. We got everything in San Diego is based on the missions. And what did the missionaries do down here was, you know, you don't want to follow our religion. We're going to cut your hands off. We're going to blah, blah. And our whole our whole damn baseball team is named after that, you know? And we, we kind of make it a joke. We got the fat fryer and all this stuff. It's like, okay, I mean, I mean, I'm a baseball fan, but yeah. that's, uh, that's, that just sucks that we did that, you know? It's, it's, it's like Cleveland Indians or something like that. It's like that bad or yeah. worse, you know? Interesting. Um, yeah. It's like something like that. So if they change their name to something else and the Redskins and the stuff's like, but we won't because it's not, it's not offensive technically to some, right. I mean, but then if you look at it, whoa, wow. What did we do? You have <laughs> to have a really nuanced view of the history of the term San Diego Padres in, <laughs> in order to, you know, jump onto the side of like, this is a team that has a name that is worthy of being changed because that flips everything. When you think about that, you know? People don't like when I say that. Uh, people in San Diego don't like when I say that. I'm at all. sure they don't. But that's what it's named after. That's what we're doing. And what it's we came over here in con- with conquest in the name of, you know, Catholicism or Christianity or whatever, because the Spanish came down through Mexico and up through you know blah. blah. It was the missions. All the missions in California yep. are based on taking away the the religiosity of the Native Americans. Yeah. You know. So we've got this next line here. It's kind of a long one, but uh, so I'm sorry if I mm-hmm. you know for reading it all the way through, but it says, we, (laughs) we, we both read from the same old played out scripts and hum familiar tunes broadcast on fixed frequencies stuck in locking grooves. We both profess noble intent as we civilize human impediments. Mm -hmm. So if your hands are clean, then noblesse oblige Mm -hmm. that you wipe that you who me look off of your face and concede our designs separated by nothing more than place and time. So we've got this French term, uh, noblesse oblige that translates to nobility's obligation, mm-hmm. which I think is, is really interesting. Um, you know, acting with honor or generosity or whatever towards like the people of lower social class and yeah, et cetera. And so it's like in the context of the lyric, it's like um, an apology for assuming. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about your, your thoughts on this passage here, because it's, it's very dense. And um, this is going to this lyric is one that's going to take me a long time to unpack in the coming months. Right. Well, as it should, like, it's a very um, it's another thing about like I was saying about the guilt of or your calling, if you will, or your like um, your moral obligation, your noblesse oblige to you have you have the means by which to do so and you're not doing anything about it like even it can go it'd be as simple as voting some people aren't allowed to vote even in america some yeah. people are not allowed to vote in other countries um it's your it's your moral obligation to do that for them or it's your moral obligation to help feed the poor because that's what the bible or you know you, the, the god you worship tells you to do um it's your moral obligation to spread the gospel by any means necessary by killing or cutting off hands or anything like that um i mean that's extreme but that's what that's what happened um he does say uh the fixed frequencies and they're locked in the groove it's like it sounds to me like at that part chris or the the pen the pen writer, the author, or he's talking to third, uh, about uh, two other people is like people who maybe grew up believing this, <clears throat> uh, singing these hymns in church. Um, you're locked into the groove of, you know, it, like not like a vinyl groove, but like you're in there, you're singing, you're not, you're singing about words that you don't even like understand or know about or anything like that as a kid, because you're like, oh yeah, you know, we're just reading from this book. It's written by some white dude in the 1600s or even earlier, and we're still singing it. Um, even even the song as even a, a famous song like Amazing Grace was written by a person on a slave, a white person on a slave ship to America. He hearing the sounds, the hums, the humming of the slaves underneath. Uh, and he turned it into a song that we still now sing to this day as an, a, like a Christian anthem. Um, and then I'm not even going to get into the Star Spangled Banner, but um, yeah, not not today. But um, but uh, 
these fixed frequencies. So like Amazing Grace, Star Spangled Banner, those would be fixed frequencies because like everyone knows them. You're forced to sing those as a kid, almost at, at like the Pledge of Allegiance and a lot of stuff as a kid, which I always kind of turn my back on. It's like, I don't pledge to the flag. Like I, you know, even as a young church kid, I knew that that's not where we're, I didn't, I didn't feel right about that. Um, it's so weird that whole that whole thing but we're we're taught these things these catechisms like the these if you are if you believe in this then here's da, 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 da. And you could go as simple as saying it's the ten commandments you can go as complex as saying like you know breaking down bringing it down into greek or aramaic and really studying that but the song he's trying to say all this stuff in like you know what less than three minutes um he's, or i'm sorry less than four minutes on this one but like he's trying to say all these things uh again with the part that I don't understand about the lyrics, I'll just say is um, when the backups are like banana all the time, because yeah. I can't, I'm trying at first, when you first hear it, that's the first thing I heard, but then I could try to, I could shut that off in my mind and really hear what the lyrics lyrics are saying. They're just basically saying, yeah, um, God, God told these people to go take this land. And, but now everyone's fighting over it because like I said, God told them both that it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> who's right. Who's wrong. Um, whoever has the most power. Yeah. Well, and then there's a like a comply resist mm. sort of uh, lyric, the noble intent to be civilized human impediments and seeing Dang. humans as a barrier to achieving something that you believe you have the God ordained and given mm. right to accomplish human beings as impediments is is a really striking visual when you think yeah. about how many people yeah. have just been mowed down and get them know, out of the way plowed yeah. under mm -hmm. um so then we have this or buried next, if you will totally and then we have this next line which has another biblical reference and i went on biblegateway.com and I, I i looked up that uh let he who is without sin cast the first stone um, so I found this next line, different scenes, same crimes, pray, let him who's without sin cast the first. And so I, I pulled it it's like from gospel, of John chapter eight. So mm -hmm. when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. <clears throat> and so this is an interesting line. And then it's like, the uh, first statues of the former rogues turned folk heroes that your forefathers hung. So we have this reference to the Bible again and uh, talking about former rogues turned folk heroes, which is <laughs> one of the most recognizable lyrics in the song, most likely to a lot of listeners because of the way that the lyrics are brought forward in the mix yeah. and kind of emphasized on that quiet musical uh, moment. Mm -hmm. So let me know what you think about these lyrics. Sure. Yeah, yeah former rogues being folk heroes that's i mean that could be back in the day when when almost like you know i wasn't around but i don't i don't know how the voting system worked for the, uh, voting for someone like abraham lincoln or some or even mm -hmm. or slave owners like thomas jefferson right. the fathers of our country um of, uh, quote unquote um the people on mount rushmore who are uh, every single person on there could, you could you could make a critique about any one of them about being a bad person also you know at those but those are our folk heroes you know those are like <laughs> the people we sing songs about or the people we learn about in those history books by written by those europeans yeah. um stuff like that um or or even putting up a statue of robert e lee down in the south and, and fighting to take that down or anything like that it's like how are we how are, how do we epitomize i mean going back to even a throwback to what we were just talking about making a statue of the father Junipero Serra in San Diego. It's like, why would we put that up? Yeah. Um, wow. Yes. He put, he founded our, you know, he made our city and missions and all that stuff, but at what cost? Um, <laughs> former wrote, so how did your desert bloom? It's like yeah. you're ending the song and this question and he's uh, laying out the word bloom for so long. It's like, to me, that's, it's a very sad line. It's like, what did it take to make this beautiful? San Diego is America's finest city. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's got all the stuff that you could want in a city. At, but how did we get there? You know what I mean? Like how? Ugh, how can this? Like how do we get this city? And then, or even I could even break it into the Mexican American War. It's like this was not ours, right? <laughs> um, but uh, and the, the biblical story about the let he who is without sin cast the first stone has become in, in context with in so many other stories and stuff like that. It's because like yeah, uh, all these Pharisees and everyone saying like kill the person who's doing wrong or kill the person who's not agreeing with you or i don't agree with your political standpoint so we're enemies we're mortal enemies because you you know you you blasphemed my beliefs or whatever um the that's in that story in particular it's like jesus is like well 
if you're not, if you're a better person than she is, go ahead. Yeah. Kill her, do it. You do it, you know? And then nobody did. And then, um, he's like, see, you know, what, what I tell you, if, if, if you can be a better person than that, then go for it. And they, but you know, you know that you're not. So if you ever had the chance to sit down with one of your mortal enemies and say, we're enemies because of this. And if you can prove me wrong, then go ahead and kill me. But, uh, they'd be like, uh, but in the movie, of course, there'd be the super crazy enemy who would just shoot you or whatever. But if they're, if you're a real human, or if you have humanity, you probably, and if you had all your marbles together in your head, you probably wouldn't kill somebody based on your, your beliefs, no matter how much you argue on Twitter or Instagram about, you know, who's the best person running for president or whatever, or which denomination, like, how do we have so many denominations of church? And anyways, there's only, if you're only supposed to be worshiping jesus or god or all three or whatever it's like why are there so many denominations why isn't there one right no one's going to give me that answer yeah because they're wrong (laughs) and you reference that that how does your desert bloom line but we also have to talk about the term entree new which leads into that which is french yeah between us so between us how did that desert bloom that you live in there over there why why is tel aviv so so stinking beautiful (laughs) You know what yeah. I mean? Uh-huh. And it's, so it's like this uh, it's Chris is like, hey, wink, wink. Give me the real story behind how you got something that, this beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like we know how you how you managed to pull this off. Mm-hmm. And then something else that really sticks out to me is um, I was thinking about a film that the journalist Thomas Friedman from The New York Times made called. Um, oh, gosh, what was it called? Uh, straddling it's called straddling the fence Hmm. he made this film in about 2005 and it's about the fences that separate israel from the west bank and the gaza strip and it's about the you know the walls the barriers that Mm -hmm. run across the entire country and people they're like it's like a scar ripping through the heart of judea and samaria the biblical heart of the country Mm -hmm. and how friedman throughout the film interviews people who are saying things like how about we all just have an equal vote here how about how about we have a one state solution and we all just have one person one vote and we actually live the principles of a liberal democracy Hmm. and how that would you know how the re-enfranchisement of disenfranchised people uh could have such a a massive effect on the way that everything is going. So it's like the, in this line here, it's like, um, while you like lounging carefree in your cafe is absolved from sin and (laughs) human grenades, uh, how it's like, well, what if we re-enfranchised a lot of people and turn this into an actual liberal democracy where there's actual votes being counted. Mm -hmm. So that is a really fascinating thing to where you, you talked about voter disenfranchisement earlier. And I'm like, what if, what if like that wound up shaking out one day where like this, uh, Holy land, uh, becomes a one state solution. And there's a re-enfranchisement of the currently five plus million disenfranchised people who are in the region. Uh, what would that wind up shaking out? You know, and these are the questions that I ask myself whenever I think about a song, like this uh what what would happen if there was a re-enfranchisement you know does that make sense oh it, it does make sense and i i cannot picture it to be honest um it's like why in that sense why wouldn't we just give land back to mexico or you know like what i mean i'm familiar with border walls and yeah. uh, <laughs> like what like what is stopping countries from just saying i mean it happened it happened i guess not too long ago with like you know, South Sudan or like, you know, different Czech Republic, like there's, there's ways to do it. People can do it. Like you can yeah. move, you can move borders. Like people, it's just, a, it's power and it's money and, and it's humans. It's like, we're not going to budge. We're going to fire missiles into your city. We're not yeah. going to budge. We're going to just keep calling you racist names and dogs. And you like, God told us like, this is yeah. our land. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, uh, so it's so sad and disheartening that to me, just to think that what you just said could never happen. You know, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that though. Living on that border. I live on a border here with Canada. So Buffalo, I can, whenever I ride my bike down to downtown Buffalo, I can see Canada. It's like 10 minutes away from me. Um, tell me about that, that San Diego Tijuana border. Cause like, if you think about whenever I picture Israel, Palestine, 
I picture the walls that I've seen mm -hmm. from studying the region. Mm -hmm. Tell me about like what it's like for you and what, what like a wall system sort of like looks like and feels like on, on your end of the country. Sure. I, I have a feeling it's different from the Buffalo border wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. probably a little bit of a different world. There's no even. wall here. None. It's just a river. It's the Niagara river. What? Why? Then why, how, how, why can't we do that? I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's parts of the border of uh, Mexico border where there is not, there is not, you know, like this real grand or whatever. There's not like such a, such a wall. And, and some parts of the, the border wall are, are you, you can pass an arm through, you know, like you can, you can pass food through or gifts or whatever, like on the, the beach. Um, there's a, there's a wall there. Um, but it's just strange because it's literally, uh, it's literally a boundary between you and another person. It's literally physically the manifestation of division. <laughs> yeah. It's literally dividing us. And, um, well, more recently as, as a political country, but like, dividing us from other humans except for that one point where you can reach across the the, the border park um and there is there's a lot of people in san diego who work in san diego who live down there they cross the border every day to to go it's like an extra three or four hours on your day to do so um but but living living down there is more affordable for some people and and less and more carefree to some to some degree um, there's parts of in Tijuana where I have friends that live like on the beach for very, very affordably. And they can see downtown San Diego from, from there. It's nice. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it is crossing into a third world country right away. You can walk across, drive across, whatever. Um, you can, a lot of times when we, if we fly to a, one of the major cities in Mexico that are down South, <clears throat> you, you, we fly out of Tijuana, you walk across and then fly from there. So it's, it's a little bit different experience than flying from one of the American cities. Mm -hmm. But, um, it is definitely a whole, it's a whole nother country. It's a whole nother world. And it's right here. I can see it from my house. You yeah. know, um, the, the third worldness of it is, it's kind of, it's very interesting and sad and disheartening at, at times. It can also be very beautiful and uplifting. Um, it's Tijuana right here on the border is one of the biggest cities, like as far as population, but also just like density and expansiveness. It keeps basically the borders of Tijuana it seems like they just keep growing. They keep adding borders so they can add more people into the space. Yeah, and they just keep going. They keep uh, growing uh, east because Tijuana is on the west side, of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it's just expanding, expanding, expanding more by the millions, um, adding refugees from other places and stuff like that. So it's kind of um, it's just it's very hard to explain to people who have never experienced Mexico or Tijuana or, or even San Diego because we have our own cuisine, we have our own fusion. There's a lot of uh, immigrants from other countries that aren't you know, Mexican or Spanish speaking countries there. So we get a lot of other culinary influences. So I, I, I thrive on that. A lot of the San Diego chefs have open spots down there or brewers or coffee makers. They've, they've opened spots down there because it's such a cross-cultural connection. Um, and, but it's like I said, so different at the same time and the punk rock and metal scene down there are, are rad. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Well, Josh, what is, um, give me, give me like kind of like an overall lesson that fixed frequencies makes you think about like give me give me sort of like a, a takeaway lesson on why this song generally matters to you as somebody who cares about the world and people man um chris and t and and co chris and co this is i think this i think potemkin's my favorite album overall mm -hmm. it's conduce it's a very it's a very cohesive record um they're all they all have they're all good records in their own merit of course and and less talk probably means the most to me of uh, in my journey but but um potemkin city limits just it's so smart i think it's such a smart record um every song is is smart and even the title of the album is just like what is he he's gonna he's gonna tell us something right here we're about to learn and it's a whole the whole album is a lesson this song in particular um like what why does chris care so much to teach me about religion what what are you trying to tell me here you know master chris like yeah. what why do you keep talking about this um because religion is not just jesus died for our sins jesus rose on easter it's like there's a whole there's this whole human bloody history that got even to, even before jesus was around there's a whole history of you know Christian. I, I love telling people that Jesus was not a Christian. Right. I love telling people that Jesus was an immigrant, yeah. and illegal, you know, born to an un unwed mother by a refugee parent. Um, 
people don't like that. People don't like hearing that, but it's true. There was no white people in the Bible. You know, mm -hmm. there was no white people in the Bible. Um, it's not, it's not written for Americans. You know, you know, the, the, the mention of the, the album title, Potemkin City Limits is super important here, I mm -hmm. feel, yeah. because if you go to a, say you go to a church in like what could only be described as a basketball arena in right. parts of the United States, mm -hmm. um, like um, if you if you turn on HBO and you watch like the the TV righteous series gemstones. Ri righteous gemstones, I'm thinking about churches like that, <laughs> so right? <good. laughs> and I know that's a comedy, but churches like that, the physical building structure with like the stadium seating and the sound system and the bands and everything that all mm -hmm. exists. And so to me, that is like a Potemkin city where oh, yeah. you have the shiny veneer and then you have the cultural rot underneath mm -hmm. uh which is motivated and inspired by greed and profit mm -hmm. and enriching um the exact people that people's history of the world was talking about mm -hmm. you know from another yeah. song yeah and to me you know chris is saying that the you know in israel it's like a a potemkin city where it you know, a lot of people have described parts of Israel as looking exactly like some of the most beautiful parts of Southern California. Yeah. You know? Right. And so he's saying that like, we have this, like this beautiful shiny veneer of the building facades that Grigory Potemkin was putting up along the Dnieper river. And, but we have the rot behind it that is sure. just being covered up and, you know, painted over. So to me, that's like, this song is one of the most vivid examples of Potemkin cities mm -hmm. on this record, which didn't even include the song Potemkin City Limits on it, you know? So <laughs> right, to yeah. me, this is this almost could be like the title track of this record, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. I, I it's it's my favorite song on the record. I picked it out of you know their whole cat their whole catalog. Obviously, you if you let you gave me freedom to pick songs and I I wanted to pick this whole album like I could have <laughs> dissected this album because I love it. And um, like I said, Chris came with the intention to teach on this record, I think. And as from a teaching standpoint, from what I know is like you go in expecting, you know, there's some there's certain things that you already expect the students to know. And there's certain things that you you need them to know from each lesson. And there's certain things that you expect them to know after you're done teaching. Right. The, mm -hmm. And the, the, at least in the maybe maybe that's not didactic for me, but like maybe in a sense that Chris and he references his other albums a lot too. They, he, I should say they reference their other albums a lot. Um, I, I, they throw back all the time. They include lyrics from other songs in uh, Potemkin city limits is like you said, not even on this record. Um, <laughs> it's like, ha, he's smart. I think he knows these things. He's prescient. Um, I think Chris could be a professor at teaching these things in college at, to some degree. Like, um, because like I said, he's been teaching me since I was before I turned 20, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and I and I reference his lyrics daily, almost like almost like biblically, like it'll come up like a movie quote or something. I'll be like, yep. you know, hey, how did your desert bloom or like, you know, like uh, all these other things. Um, and and the whole thing about Potemkin City, I, we got a couple of them here in San Diego. We, we take our landfills and we co put a cover, cover them up with brand new cities. Like, yeah, the, the most beautiful neighbor, highest point in North County is San Lee Hill Hills. And that used to be the dump. Wow. And it's, it's, it's like they built these rad houses, it's all this new stuff. It's kind of like off the, you know, it's, it's elite and it's on a dump. <laughs> wow. Dude, <laughs> and, if you ever, if you ever go to Winnipeg, make sure you go to a pilgrimage to garbage Hill. Okay. Sounds, it sounds delicious. <laughs> I love it. Well, Josh, what an amazing conversation on fixed frequencies. Thank, Thank you so you, yeah. much for, for chatting with me about that song. And that is so good. It's a good song. Amazing. It's a good song, dude. Thanks for having me. All right, so Josh, let's jump forward from 2005 to 2017, and yes. we'll go to the Victory Lap LP, and we will talk about the song Tartuffe, and every single chance I have on this podcast that Tartuffe comes up, I have to say that I theorized in our original Tartuffe episode 
that we came here to rock was a reference to the band Saxon and Chris, <laughs> uh, corrected no, no, no. me. <laughs> he corrected me on the Patreon and said that it was not a reference to Saxon. So I feel like it is my duty because I'm not going to delete that episode. Like the error is in that episode forever, but I feel like every time that song comes up, I have to say that we came here to rock is not a reference to Saxon and that that episode is wrong in several places. <laughs> so there's that. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, the music of Tartuffe and what this tune does for you musically and performance wise. Okay. Um, starting with the, the music again is <laughs> so Saxon aside um, the song, the music on this one is obviously just, metal tinged party rock awesome music you know it's yeah. like not skate punk this is definitely propaganda at their most metal at some points you know like um uh just really kind of showing off their licks showing off the talent of their their love for metal their love for like early dirty metal mm -hmm. um i think that i don't know I, the the sequencing on this this album to have this record where it is it's an it's a nice um it's almost like you the the first from the first riff of this album on victory lap which is also a rad song first song um that's you're, you're taking your sip of your cold brew coffee in the morning or whatever yeah. you're, you're getting your energy drink whatever you drink in the morning to, to wake up whether it's not tea or whatever by the time tartuffe comes in you've already kind of you've you've maybe taken a rest you've crashed a little bit and then tartuffe comes in you're like what the fuck what, what? okay yeah. I'm, a, I'm awake you got me you know um so tartuffe really stands tartuffe really serves a purpose on this album for for a couple of reasons musically solid banging yeah. fun i bet they had so much fun writing the music for this song yeah i bet i bet this was so fun to practice or if you're in the room listening to them play this i bet you would just be smiling ear to ear and they've just performed this song twice for the first time live ever so they this song is now in the live set for the first time since it was written you got to see it I saw it two times. Was it fun? Amazing. Amazing. Totally, yeah. totally amazing. They, I... they did it better the second time. It was, but I posted the full version of Tartuffe on our Instagram. Perfect. So if anybody wants to see the first ever live performance of Tartuffe, uh, you can see it on the Propaganda Pod Instagram page. And I put it up. They performed it for the first time live ever, <laughs> May 25th, 2022 at Lee's Palace in Toronto. That is so rad. I'm going to see them in September when they come to San Diego with a uh, very stoked to see them. They're touring with La Armada, the, the Chicago hardcore band. Yep. Um, I, I don't know this song. It's, it's just so fun. It's like, and it, it harkens back to me. It's a throwback song, like a partner song almost to, to Days Empires. Nice. Cool. I like to party fucking hard. It's like yes. the same opening, like, come here. We're going to put your arm around somebody in the pit and just like, you know, blah, blah, everything they sing against, but they're like, this makes you want to do that. <laughs> I love how you just compliment, like partnered this song. I like seeing like patterns within the, with the songs and seeing how like certain songs complement each other. Like mm -hmm. I like to notice like things like I see, um, like fuck machine and, um, you know, refusing to be a man and ladies night in loserville and Tartuffe as being like a series Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a mini series across the entire existence mm -hmm. of the band. So this one to me is like part of like a, a quad of songs that, yeah. that just kind of go through the entire breadth of the catalog, which I love. Well, what an interesting topic to even write about too. Yeah. Like, like again, the music, I, I didn't get to say it about a couple of your songs, but the way Chris breaks down his, um, like his lyrical structure over the music. Like I, I, I can't figure out how to do that. Like on, um, even on fixed frequencies, you read da, da, like singing those many notes over the music they're playing, or mm -hmm. I'm sorry, those little notes over that length of time over yeah. the music they're playing. It's like, my mind can't even do that. He's got like three parts of his brain, not two, you know, it's like the way you, the way you can break down these words. Like I said, it's like one giant paragraph and he's somehow making it this beautiful <laughs> this lyrical song yeah. so on this song and like just the way he's saying like you think it's going to be like a, a metal like balls to the wall you know uh lyric 30 lyrics a second kind of thing but it's not it's like you know sing along to the front debbie that's the back and then it starts to starts the song you know yeah. you, you think it's going to be this like ah song the whole time but it's like oh we're talking about 
a French playwright from the 1600s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And that's the th- that's the funny thing too about comedy is, is like it's taking something that you think and and making you know satirical or fun of it or whatever, but like in a smart way. And because because the the author of the play is credited as being one of the the best playwrights in that category. Yeah. And obviously Chris is one of the best playwrights in his category. Keep going with the lyrics too. Let's just let's just move right into the to the lyrical composition here and tell me what you think about the the song. You can go through it however you want. We we did like the full song on the episode where we went That's through true, line huh? by line. That's so true. I'm not gonna punish you with the line by line dissection <laughs> like I you did can with still uh, because my, my take you know, my take is a little bit different, I think. It, I love to hear art. it. It's art, and I think that I'm I love reading comedy. I love reading plays like that. Like, you know, I try to find comedy in things. I try to find humor in life because if you don't believe life is funny or, or find the humor in it, like it's just really dark and bleak. Yes. Life could be either way. I mean, it's, it is what it is. Like it's out, everything's happening out there. And we could say that that's, uh, or we could f- try to find humor in some stuff. So that's one good thing about Instagram. Sometimes it's like, you know, you could doom scroll or you could be like, what's funny today or whatever. I mean, so t- Tartuffe, like, like I said, what a what a weird thing to pick a, pick a song about. But if you if you dissect the play or anything like that, it's like this play is not actually that funny. Mm. You know, like he's talking, he's again talking about hypocrisy in the church. Maybe maybe it's a comedy because he's because that seems funny. Because who would do that? <laughs> the playwright at that time was thinking that. Um, but then the more I dug into the the lines. Um, I guess, like I, like you said, I don't want to get too too crazy with the lines because you already did it. But the, um, I realized that as I keep talking about this this you know the stepdad in my life, the figure, um, he the reason I don't some some things I don't like about the church or Christianity is because of you know somebody like somebody like um, my dad or Tartuffe or Donald Trump or or um, uh, Mark Driscoll or these 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 kind of Christians people who say they're Christians but they're also assholes. Mm-hmm. Christian assholes, right? Yeah. I don't, those are the kind of people that drive me personally away from the church um, <clears throat> or anybody really. If somebody who's not in the church, if they see people like that and be like, whoa, I do not want to go to that church. I don't well, want to be, you know? Well, and in a, in a huge uh, blanket defense of those kinds of folks is um, people try to distance themselves from people who are assholes like that. They're like, they're not real Christians, mm-hmm. but no, no, no. I don't think that it is for anyone to decide what a person who professes to be something. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's, I don't think it's my job to say they're not a real X, Y, Z. Do you know what I mean? If they say yeah. that they are, then I essentially have to take them at their word, even if they're an asshole. So I think that yeah. we should acknowledge that these are assholes, but they are, uh, indicative and representative of a community exactly. who, even if it's a sliver of a community, it mm-hmm. is still a, an, a, a representation of a particular facet of a community. So saying mm-hmm. they're not a real X, Y, Z doesn't fly with me at all. No, it's the same with any, any religion here. Also the, the microcosms of, you know, different parts of, um, the Buddhist representation in San Diego or an Islamic uh, representation in San Diego. It's like they fight amongst themselves too for, Oh, you're not wearing the right thing or you're not praying at the right time, or you're not following the rules basically of the religion. It's like, well, we still believe the same thing, right? (laughs) We still worship the same God or master. It's like, leave me alone. Um, In, in the play and in the song, I, I also love the fact that, single moms to the front hell yeah mom let's yeah take me to the concert you're up front rocking and that's my experience with music is single mo- i mean she was she got married after a while but like i went to a lot of concerts with my mom and my aunt like single moms to the front deadbeat that's the back and the whole and the whole throwback again not just to the the feel of back to the motor league but like the feel of, or the lyrical throwback to let's talk more rock he says literally in the in the song go back to let's talk more rock, you know? Yeah. Um, because we did all that already. Now I'm talking about this topic and a uh, one reason, another reason about the, the, the lyrics in this one, I, I feel are smart. They're, they're tongue in cheek. They're funny. They're whatever, but it, the song is not like the music isn't funny. The music is like, boom, 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 boom. Like, and then the lyrics are also the same way. Um, in, in a comedy in general, or in a play in a good, well-written five act play, the, the zenith of the play, the real everything is at act three. And then it kind of something happens in act four and then act five, everything comes together. 
Yeah. And he says that in the, in the, in, in one line, he said, tells us how theater works, mm-hmm. you know, act three to act five, um, in the play, I'm sure you, you already told everybody everything about it, but I was, I was, uh, relating that to it not being a comedy anymore by act five. It's not a comedy mm. by act five. It's like, if you want to say, let's, let's pretend, like I said, that it's an asshole Christian person or any religion, or just let's take religion out of it. It's, it's Donald Trump or it's Joe Biden or it's somebody, somebody is, is uh, Tartuffe in this play, yeah. you know, that, that you can see it through, through those eyes. If you're like uh, anti Trump or anti Biden or, or Justin Trudeau or whatever, put that person as Tartuffe. Everybody in human history is somewhat of a hypocrite. Like you, you, you want to boycott AT&T or you want to boycott uh, Nike because they have sweatshops or whatever. It's like, but you're typing on your iPhone. <laughs> you're yeah. saying that on Twitter and all these companies owned by billionaires, you're using those platforms to boycott something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're a hypocrite or you, you are a Christian and saying all this stuff, but then also you support other things that maybe Jesus wouldn't support. And we're you know all I mean? guilty so, of it too. You know what all I mean? Guilty of it. Every all guilty single one of us, of we all are of something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of vegan activism, but I'm also, I also cook meat. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm never a chef. I have, I cook for the masses. Yeah. You know, I do food pairings based on my clientele. And then I realized that that's, that's basically what humans, humans love to do that. Yeah. Humans we love, love to, to categorize ourselves. Or even, even on the other end of things on the, on the more left side of things, it's like you, you hating me because I'm gay means you're an asshole. It's like, mm-hmm. Whoa, I don't, well, tell me why, instead of calling me an asshole, tell me why how can we be friends? Like, I didn't know that you were gay for one reason. I didn't know that you were vegan. I didn't know that you were sober. Like these things, like the people who are struggling with whatever, or, or they happen to be gay or vegan or sober or whatever, sometimes they lash out at other person for not understanding them. But like the person didn't know they're just, we assume things like that's why they use, you know, everybody uses pronouns now, like he, him, or they, or all the pronouns that are available Yeah. because you're trying to help another person understand you or to be professional or, give a, a polite context of how you are as a human, mm-hmm. you know? Um, <laughs> but we, we love to like the actors in the play, like show off our class, our nobility or our wealth or, or our piety or, you know, or anything like that. Like we love to show that off because it makes you feel even putting a sticker on, like I voted. Yeah. Like, Hey, guess what? Boom, boom, boom. You know, <laughs> yada, yeah. yada, yada. you know, it's like the, the meme of the urinals. There's like 10 urinals. The guy on the yeah. left comes up, yeah, I voted. <laughs> yeah. Or, I'm vegan. Um, all these different things. It's like, okay, well, what is that? Are you saying that if I didn't or I'm not, then I'm the asshole? Or uh, you're telling me if I'm not Christian, then I'm an asshole? Or like, how does that work? <laughs> you know, um, this is this is a, a song that Chris mentioned when they were writing it. They actually intended it for be the, to be the opening track Mm, of this nice. of the record they thought this was going to be the song that opened the record and then it wound up getting you know shoehorned into the 11th position mm-hmm. which i think who will help me bake this bread was also the Side 11th B, yeah. song yeah and um people's history was like the 12th track so you've picked some songs that are like buried in these records like three out of your four that you chose are like buried way deep in records and who will help me bake this bread um and you know, fixed frequencies and people's history of the world are songs that are not played. You know what I mean? So these are, you've picked some, some songs that are, Deep you know, cuts. they're, they're left out these days, you know? And I know that yeah. fixed frequencies is challenging because of the vocals and the complexity behind the range right. of the vocals, but yeah. you know, you, you pick some, some deep ones here. <clears throat> um, yeah. Why do you think that is? Did we just become a therapy session? Um, Maybe. <laughs> awesome. Good. Because I, I know why is because oftentimes as artists, as writers, we're not always writing kind of for the fans. We're not mm-hmm. always writing the crowd, the crowd pleasing songs, the fist raisers, the, the sing alongs, you know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes when I've seen propaganda, everyone's singing along because they're so popular, yeah. but like they're not, yeah. Like you said, they're not playing these ones per se, but like, sometimes that's as an artist, you can put your most into that, into these songs because you're not writing it for other people. Does it, that make it, like, I don't know. I don't know. Chris is writing method on, on these kind of songs, but, or, or the team, but like there, 
there's like a lot of complexity in these songs. Yeah. Like they almost make it too hard to play live. Sometimes mm -hmm. they'd like do it on purpose. So they can't, or um, they do it. They write it for us podcasters. So we can just, you know, wax philosophical for an hour on a song or whatever. I love it. It's like, it's like, it's like, yeah, he's, he's, and, and as a fan, as a true fan, I think, I feel like sometimes the singers are, are writing like to me, yeah. like, they're, sometimes they're writing about my ADHD or they're writing about my struggles with the church or they're writing about my, my family or whatever the case may be, even though he's, he's not, I'm, he's, we've never met face to face or whatever, you know? Um, but as a, as an artist to a fan relationship, I think that's one thing that's why music is so um, universal and, and grabbing us. And I always, I keep saying music with a capital M, like the, the mother, the muse is like bringing us all in under the, you know, kind of the way the shepherds, you know, watch or whatever the case may be. It's like, we are all here to hear this song. We are all here to enjoy this together. And that's why like, it's, it's really crazy when people go to shows to be violent or go to shows to not listen to the band. They just want to like, they never look at the band. They always look at inside the crowd or it's like, that's an experience. Sure. You're, you are having experience and I can't take that away from you, but you know, uh, I came here, we came here to rock. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, I wanna, it's just like Chris sums it up with the, with, uh, the lyrics sometimes like if if these were acapella or spoken word or like i said sung by an r&b artist like picture james ingram singing this song or i don't know um voice to men it's like this song could be sung i mean i don't know about tartuffe necessarily but some of the propaganda songs could be sung by other artists because they're written with such an artistic pen yeah well tell me a little bit about i'm going to shift gears here in a second mm -hmm. but i'm wondering mm -hmm. about your your overall assessment of the importance of victory lap as a record tell me about this uh what you what you think about this product Dude. in general yeah this was 2017 yeah yeah so it's old um, now well yeah but think about the time that it came out um to, we just had a, a weird election in the usa a weird yep. presidential election could have gone uh, multiple ways um went a weird way went for, the way it me. did for me it went a weird way for me it went a weird it didn't go a weird way for many but like yeah it 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 it, it was what it was yeah. um victory lap comes out af after that <laughs> after that election stuff and i'm not going to say that they're related per se but like if you're thinking about the songs on victory lap is like when when were they writing these songs <clears throat> yeah here a lot of times he's writing about how he was brought up or whatever, but he's also writing about current events. Right. Um, and I can't stop thinking that Tartuffe is Trump. <laughs> mm. I can't stop thinking. I can't, I can't disrelate or unrelate. I can't separate this song from Donald Trump. Yeah. For me. Um, and victory lap being like, if, but if you look at victory lap, it's a, the roller coaster. It's a, yeah. it's a giant roller coaster sinking basically in the ocean. Um, I don't think that's unintentional. You know, the album as a whole is also, I feel like the artwork should be a part of the, is part of the, the, the part of the music, part of the album. Like they, they're intentional on that. I, yeah. I, I hope, I hope it was intentional. Um, Chris, please tell me, um, <laughs> like, like victory lap as a, as a, as a, not as a, as a whole album, victory lap being, being different parts of the roller coaster. And where am I sitting on those cars on the roller coaster? Or am I on the tracks about to get run over? Or am I under the water? You know what I mean? Or am I the operator? Like, where am I as a listener on this album? Yeah. And that's the, that's the way I look at all their records. But Victory Lap also is easy to do that with because they put this like structure. They built a structure on the on the cover. <clears throat> and then Tartuffe, where is Tartuffe on this roller coaster, dude? Like, like, like I, it's really hard to, not hard. It's hard to explain, I guess, the, the not, it's not the love I have for this song, but it's more like the emotions it makes happen. That's such an interesting question. Where is Tartuffe on the roller coaster? Mm, I love wow. that. <laughs> okay, so Josh, give me a, an overview of any and all times you've seen Propagandy. Tell me about a, the live experience history that you have with the band. Oh, okay. Um, well, the very first time I saw them, like I said, it was... Um, they played world beat center in San Diego and which is a very, it's a multicultural venue. It's got like representation of all countries on the, uh, you know, painted murals on the outside. And nice. Yeah. It's like, it's not your traditional, um, you know, show venue where you would see your favorite bands, but they, like I said, they, they like to represent everything. And so it was really cool that they, I don't know if they chose that or a booking agent or whatever, but it was like, 
to me, that was like special. That was the only punk rock or hardcore show I, I had ever seen there uh, or their first one I had seen. And um, it's like I said, it was them, Good Riddance and an opening band. And so it was really cool. Um, the, the stage was like in the center of the room, like not like surrounded the audience wow, surrounded the stage. It was cool. not, yeah. So there was like a little bit of room to, to kind of mosh pit if people were into that, but it wasn't really set up for that. Weird. And it was, it was really, and there was levels. It was cause it was like a, a performance center. It was a, like a theater center. It was, it was super interesting to see that. And I've never seen another show like that. Um, and that was the first time I saw them and they were playing like, you know, I think they opened with Ska Sucks. Maybe? Interesting. Yeah. Or something like that. And, um, cause it was, it was a, a nod to the, the culture that was in there. Cause there was like, there was definitely Zionism represented in there and, you know, reggae Rastafarianism and it were, was in the building and, uh, they did that and they got some booze and stuff like that. Cause it was at the height of Scott punk and being on the radio. And then, um, yeah, they were, it was sold out. It was popular. I think there was maybe a, a thousand people there or something like that. And they played all these songs and they offended everybody and, and, and everyone loved it at the same time. Yeah. Was and it the, the era where Chris would like basically yell at everybody between every song? <laughs> they were doing, yeah. And of course, you know, this was, they were, you know, drumsticks up their ass and that kind of stuff. Like they were, they were into like instigation to yeah. me and, and I loved it. I, I really liked that. And, but he wasn't violent or anything like that. Cause I could tell that the songs were kind of, that he was talking like that were kind of jokes or like, you know, talking about, you know, jocks beating up people or, you know, whatever Scott sucks while they're playing Scott. And then, um, so I was like super entertained. I was super intrigued. I wanted to be just like that. <laughs> so in seeing it live, you even made it worse for me, made, made it or worse in a good way. Like I really wanted to do that. And I, and I tried to do that for the rest of my career. Nice. Yeah. Is that the only time you ever saw him? I saw him again. Uh, no headlining at, at the bigger stage Soma. And there was like everyone, all the fans were older. You know, everyone kind of grew up with them, like I said. So, you know, more beards, more arm hair, uh, more people. You could understand the lyrics more. And and they were, <clears throat> excuse me, by the time I saw them again, it was, I think, I believe, touring on Potemkin or okay. around, they were playing those songs. So there was a lot more of the prog metal stuff, like less uh, sing-alongable sometimes, you know, for the skate punkers. <laughs> there was like, you know, more the, more of a, a musician's show, if you will, like, yeah, they're really good. They, they play really good live because they don't really mess up and they, they, um, they're all like super talented musicians, you know? And, um, that was a really fun show too, because there was thousands of, you know, there was that place can hold like 3,500 or 4,000 or something like that. Wow. And it was pretty, Never it was pretty full. Soma. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty full. I don't think it was 100% full on the main stage, but it was like, there was a lot of people there. Um, and I don't remember who played with them either, but I went there and I just remember it was like a really cool experience because yeah, there's a lot of jocks and conservative and military type people in san diego who go to punk rock shows because it's kind of the cool thing to do or whatever and yeah. i always resented that about like coming out of high school starting a punk band going to shows and then all of a sudden i'm in the pit and i see on stage you know my football nemesis is up there or whatever like he's all of a sudden into punk rock <laughs> standing on stage because he got in with the security guard or whatever yeah. you know Oh yeah, I'm totally into Lagwagon and you know, no use for a name, but he's not. I'm singing along and he's not. And so I was, I was always like, not fair. That's not cool, even though it's supposed to be welcoming for everyone. Um, but also, it's ironic that you're up there for propaganda, singing about like you know, anti jock stuff, and you know, it's like very ironic that you're up there, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the experiences I've seen with them live are, I think they're unique experiences to be honest, because it's not like another show. Um, it's not like he's funny and he's smart and he's just saying all these really smart things that might honestly might honestly go over a lot of people's heads. Yeah. I love it. Well, Josh, what a, what a sprawling journey we <laughs> we've just gone on. Um, do you want to tell everybody about what you do over yeah. at the family cast uh, to kind of like bring us in for a landing so that, people who have enjoyed our conversation can maybe spend some time checking out your fantastic show and all the hard work you've done over the years. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so a couple of years ago, I decided that I have, a, I have a lot of cool friends and a lot of cool conversations with people from multiple industries. Cause I'm a yeah. chef and a musician and whatever else I, I like to do, but like, those are my two main things. Yeah. And so I've been talking to cool people 
my whole life basically about these things. Um, and, and now I, and I found that a lot of ex musicians are, are now opening coffee shops and breweries and wineries and distilleries and all these different cool things that I'm into hot sauce. And, um, these, these rad things that I, that I use on a daily basis in my kitchen. I'm like, we need to talk about that. And so I was talking to him and like, someone's like, we should be recording these conversations. <laughs> yeah. So I just started kind of doing that. I have, I already had all the music equipment to record and to do it. So I just started talking to all these people, all these cool friends and new friends and um, heroes even and about, about life. And it's not always, I do food and music pairings as a, as a hobby, as a yeah. part of, as part of my career. So it's not always like that, but I do like, I explain to people why, this music makes me feel this way or what we're playing in the kitchen this week and why, why I'm listening to such crazy hardcore music and why that helps my ADD focus on a plate. Nice. Why, um, and people with ADD or, or focus problems will un- could understand that. For um, sure. Why, why they, why we need that boom, 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 boom to focus. Um, and then I, I also just talking l- and finding out more that a lot of my heroes or friends from the music industry have at one point or another worked in the food service industry or bartending or whatever. So just putting those all together, the family is food and music is life. Yes. And cause in the kitchen, we say, I, if I say something like, Oh, add more, I need more, two more quarts of tomato sauce where they're like, yes, chef. Yes. We say a lot of yes. I say yes. If they didn't, if I think they didn't hear me and they say yes. So there's a lot of that and that kind of, so it kind of played into the family aspect it's uh, and food and music being in there. I was going to do call it the punk rock chef or whatever, but there's already somebody with that account. And yeah. I was like, I was super bummed, but I, so I'm, so it's the punk chef podcast, but yeah, we just have been doing it for, I do it when I can, basically I do it when I can, cause I'm a very busy chef, but yeah. we have a food truck and we're always playing punk rock and, you know, propaganda and good rants and stuff. There's, they're always being played in the kitchen, uh, especially when we're doing our, our vegan menus. Um, <laughs> if, if people came to San Diego, where would they be able to find you um well like is there like a place where you would recommend finding finding your your truck and things like that to you know say say to people who are around they probably find me at a local brewery or taco shop to be honest but (laughs) but i'm but we do a ton of weddings and and special events like you know or music festivals or anything like that with with the food truck where we travel to different weddings and venues and do stuff all over san diego county and some and palm springs and stuff but like i just say hit me up on Instagram and DM me and come into the kitchen. And I'll feed you. And yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll listen to some music. I promise you, you promise me, you know, I, I hope <laughs> that anybody who's near San Diego or traveling to San Diego will consider doing that. Um, yeah. So my, <clears throat> the episodes that connect directly to this show are your episodes that you did with Ryan Onan mm-hmm. and also JP Peters, who oh, yeah. Pr- yeah. produced a couple propaganda records yeah. and was on our episode for Negretto. Um, one of my all time favorite interviews we've done for this show was with JP for that show. Love it. Um, so you have a couple of direct connections tying mm-hmm. this podcast to your podcast. So anybody out there listening, yeah. who's like, Hey, I've never heard the family cast before the Ryan O'Nan and the JP Peters episodes are direct links to where you can jump from this podcast to your podcast yeah, very point. seamlessly <laughs> and, um, and get some familiar voices. So that's what I would recommend. If you've never yeah. heard, um, Josh's show, the family cast, check out the Ryan O'Nan and the JP Peters episodes. Cause that's your first direct link. Yeah. Um, Josh drop some, uh, social media, um, account names that people can find you at. Cool. Yeah. If, if, if you use a program called Instagram, yep. um, I'm on there at the family cast and, uh, in there, there's a bio with links to everything that I do like Patreon or, or even cooking, cooking demos that I've done with, um, other musicians or, or hot sauce companies or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I have my own personal Instagram page, Josh Kemb, and there's a bunch of other links on there too, because I do go on Twitter and stuff, but it's more to like talk to other podcasters and musicians. I, uh, I'm not too crazy on there, but mostly baseball stuff. And then I have a record collection too. So I, we, I do a lot of trading and swapping. I, one of the pop-ups that I do is I do tacos and records pop-up at my kitchen. So nice, with a lot of vinyl, vinyl collection stuff, but, um, pretty active on discogs and, and the Instagram mostly. And then there's links to everything in there. Um, and also another fun thing on, on the family cast is when I do the kitchen pairing playlists, I'll like take a song and pair it with food or meat or beverage. And so we have a couple of those on there. And of course there's some propaganda on there too. So love it. That's be a good thing to check out. Well, Josh Kemble, uh, yeah. Dogwood, the family cast, <laughs> it's been a, a real pleasure having you here. And I thank you for your time. 
and your energy and your stories and, you know, just being very honest with how your life story connects to so many of these thongs. There is a through line subplot Mm -hmm. in this in this episode that we have just done where your history within like religious practice popped up in every single one. And so that was a really cool observation for me, but I'm just super grateful to you for your, uh, for your time and your energy today. Appreciate it, man. Of course you deserve it. Um, this is a, I love this podcast in particular also, um, because not only do I like the band, but, uh, you bring on, you bring on people that enlighten me. Um, I would say one of my favorite episodes was, um, Ergo Sum Papa, uh, awesome. or Ergo Fum Papa, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that I, I learned a lot from that just because I love that kind of imagery and stuff like that but for me i think this podcast provides a lot um it can it can calm me down and and they're and they're long too so i have i can listen to them like on a couple of journeys yeah (laughs) so i can appreciate that about the show so stoked to be on love it well thank you so much josh yeah 